Chapter Twenty Six of the Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lewis. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter Twenty Six. General Feathersham's portraits are appeased. Lieutenant Stutch, though he went late to bed, was early astir in the morning. He roused the household, packed and repacked his clothes, and made such a bustle and confusion that everything to be done took twice its ordinary time in the doing. There never had been so much noise and flurry in the house during all the thirty years of Lieutenant Stutch's residence. His servants could not satisfy him, however quickly they scuttled about the passages in search of this or that forgotten article of his old traveling outfit. Stutch, indeed, was in a boyish fever of excitement. It was not to be wondered at, perhaps. For thirty years he had lived inactive, on the world's half-pay list, to quote his own phrase, and at the end of all that long time, miraculously, something had fallen to him to do, something important, something which needed energy and tact and decision. Lieutenant Stutch, in a word, was to be employed again. He was feverish to begin his employment. He dreaded the short interval before he could begin, lest some hindrance should unexpectedly occur and relegate him again to inactivity. "'I shall be ready this afternoon,' he said briskly to Durrance as they breakfasted. "'I shall catch the night mail to the Continent. We might go up to London together, for London is on your way to Wiesbaden.' "'No,' said Durrance. "'I have just one more visit to pay in England.' I did not think of it until I was in bed last night. You put it into my head. Oh, observed Stutch, and whom do you propose to visit? General Feathersham, replied Durrance. Stutch laid down his knife and fork and looked with surprise at his companion. Why in the world do you wish to see him? he asked. I want to tell him how Harry has redeemed his honor, how he is still redeeming it. You said last night that you were bound by a promise not to tell him anything of his son's intentions, or even of his son's successes, until the son returned himself. But I am bound by no such promise. I think such a promise bears hardly on the general. There is nothing in the world which could pain him so much as the proof that his son was a coward. Harry might have robbed and murdered. The old man would have preferred to have him commit both these crimes. I shall cross into Surrey this morning and tell him that Harry never was a coward. Stutch shook his head. He will not be able to understand. He will be very grateful to you, of course. He will be very glad that Harry has atoned his disgrace, but he will never understand why he incurred it. And, after all, he will only be glad because the family honor is restored. I don't agree, said Durrance. I believe the old man is rather fond of his son, though to be sure he would never admit it. I rather like General Feversham. Lieutenant Stutch had seen very little of General Feversham during the last five years. He could not forgive him for his share in the responsibility of Harry Feversham's ruin. Had the general been capable of sympathy with, and comprehension of, the boy's nature, the white feathers never would have been sent to Ramelton. Stutch pictured the old man sitting sternly on his terrace at Broad Place, quite unaware that he was himself at all to blame, and on the contrary, rather inclined to pose as a martyr, in that his son had turned out a shame and disgrace to all the dead Feathershams, whose portraits hung darkly on the high walls of the hall. Stutch felt that he could never endure to talk patiently with General Feathersham, and he was sure that no argument would turn that stubborn man from his convictions. He had not troubled at all to consider whether the news which Durrance had brought should be handed on to Broad Place. "'You're very thoughtful for others,' he said to Durrance. 
It's not to my credit. I practice thoughtfulness for others out of an instinct of self-preservation. That's all, said Durrance. Selfishness is the natural and encroaching fault of the blind. I know that, so I am careful to guard against it. He traveled accordingly that morning by branch line from Hampshire into Surrey, and came to Broad Place in the glow of the afternoon. General Feathersham was now within a few months of his eightieth year, and though his back was as stiff and his figure as erect as on that night now so many years ago when he first presented Harry to his Crimean friends, he was shrunken in stature, and his face seemed to have grown small. Durrance had walked with the general upon the terrace only two years ago, and, blind though he was, he noticed a change within this interval of time. Old Feversham walked with a heavier step, and there had come a note of puerility into his voice. "'You have joined the veterans before your time, Durrance,' he said. "'I read of it in a newspaper. I would have written had I known where to write.' If he had any suspicion of Durrance's visit, he gave no sign of it. He rang the bell, and tea was brought into the great hall where the portraits hung. He asked after this and that officer in the Sudan with whom he was acquainted. He discussed the iniquities of the war office and feared that the country was going to the deuce. Everything, through ill luck or bad management, is going to the devil, sir, he exclaimed irritably. Even you, Durrance, you're not the same man who walked with me on my terrace two years ago. The general had never been remarkable for tact and the solitary life he led had certainly brought no improvement. Durrance could have countered with a tu quoque, but he refrained. But I come upon the same business, he said. Feathersham sat up stiffly in his chair. And I give you the same answer. I have nothing to say about Harry Feathersham. I will not discuss him. He spoke in his usual hard and emotionless voice. He might have been speaking of a stranger. Even the name was uttered without the slightest hint of sorrow. Durrance began to wonder whether the fountains of affection had not been altogether dried up in General Feathersham's heart. It would not please you, then, to know where Harry Feathersham has been, and how he has lived during the last five years? There was a pause, not a long pause, but still a pause before General Feathersham answered, Not in the least, Colonel Durrance. The answer was uncompromising, but Durrance relied upon the pause which preceded it. Nor on what business he has been engaged, he continued. I am not interested in the smallest degree. I do not wish him to starve, and my solicitor tells me that he draws his allowance. I am content with that knowledge, Colonel Durrance. I will risk your anger, General, said Durrance. There are times when it is wise to disobey one's superior officer. This is one of the times. Of course, you can turn me out of the house. Otherwise, I shall relate to you the history of your son and my friend since he disappeared from England. General Feathersham laughed. Of course I can't turn you out of the house, he said. And then he added severely, but I warn you that you are taking an improper advantage of your possession as my guest. Yes, there is no doubt of that, Durrance answered calmly, and he told his story. The recovery of the Gordon letters from Berber, his own meeting with Harry Feathersham at Wadi Haffa, and Harry's imprisonment at Omdurman. He brought it down to that very day, for he ended with the news of Lieutenant Stutch's departure for Suakin. General Feathersham heard the whole account without an interruption, without even stirring in his chair. Durrance could not tell in what spirit he listened, but he drew some comfort from the fact that he did listen, and without argument. For some while after Durrance had finished, the general sat silent. He raised his hand to his forehead and shaded his eyes, as though the man who had spoken could see, and thus he remained. Even when he did speak, he did not take his hand away. 
pride forbade him to show to those portraits on the wall that he was capable even of so natural a weakness as joy at the reconquest of honor by his son what i don't understand he said slowly is why harry ever resigned his commission i could not understand it before i understand it even less now since you have told me of his great bravery it is one of the queer inexplicable things they happen and there's all that can be said but i am very glad that you compelled me to listen to you durrance i did it with a definite object it is for you to say of course but for my part i do not see why harry should not come home and enter in again to all that he lost he cannot regain everything said feathersham it is not right that he should he committed the sin and he must pay he cannot regain his career for one thing no that is true but he can find another he is not yet so old but that he can find another and that is all he will have lost general feathersham now took his hand away and moved in his chair he looked quickly at durrance he opened his mouth to ask a question but changed his mind well he said briskly as though the matter were of no particular importance if stutch can manage harry's escape from Omdurman, i see no reason either why he should not come home durrance rose from his chair thank you general if you can have me driven to the station i can catch a train to town there's one at six but you will stay the night surely cried general feathersham it is impossible i start for wiesbaden early tomorrow feathersham rang the bell and gave the order for a carriage i should have been very glad if you could have stayed he said turning to durrance i see very few people nowadays to tell the truth i have no great desire to see many one grows old and a creature of customs but you have your crimean nights said durrance cheerfully feversham shook his head there have been none since harry went away i had no heart for them he said slowly for a second the mask was lifted and his stern features softened he had suffered much during these five lonely years of his old age though not one of his acquaintances up to this moment had ever detected a look upon his face or heard a sentence from his lips which could lead them so to think he had shown a stubborn front to the world he had made it a matter of pride that no one should be able to point a finger at him and say there's a man struck down but on this one occasion and in these few words he revealed to Durrance the depths of his grief. Durrance understood how unendurable the chatter of his friends about the old days of war in the snowy trenches would have been. An antidote recalling some particular act of courage would hurt as keenly as a story of cowardice. The whole history of his lonely life at Broad Place was laid bare in that simple statement that there had been no crimean nights for he had no heart for them the wheels of the carriage rattled on the gravel good-bye said durrance and he held out his hand by the way said feathersham to organize this escape from Omdurman will cost a great deal of money stutch is a poor man who is paying i am feathersham shook durrance's hand in a firm clasp it is my right of course he said certainly i will let you know what it cost thank you general feathersham accompanied his visitor to the door there was a question which he had in his mind to ask but the question was delicate he stood uneasily on the steps of the house didn't i hear durrance he said with an air of carelessness that you were engaged to miss eustace I think I said that Harry would regain all that he had lost except his career, said Durrance. He stepped into the carriage and drove off to the station. His work was ended. There was nothing more for him now to do except to wait at Wiesbaden and pray that Stutch might succeed. He had devised a plan. It remained for those who had eyes wherewith to see to execute it. General Feathersham stood upon the steps, 
looking after the carriage until it disappeared among the pines. Then he walked slowly back into the hall. There is no reason why he should not come back, he said. He looked up at the pictures. The dead Fethershams in their uniforms would not be disgraced. No reason in the world, he said, and please God, he will come back soon. The dangers of an escape from the Dervish city remote among the sands began to loom very large on his mind. He owned to himself that he felt very tired and old, and many times that night he repeated his prayer. Please God, Harry will come back soon, as he sat erect upon the bench which had once been his wife's favorite seat and gazed out across the moonlit country to the Sussex Downs. End of chapter 26chapter 27 of the four feathers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by lewis the four feathers by a e w mason chapter 27 the house of stone these were the days before the great mud wall was built about the house of stone in Omdurman. Only a thorn Zarabi as yet enclosed that noisome prison, and the space around it. It stood upon the eastern border of the town, surely the most squalid capital of any empire since the world began. Not a flower bloomed in a single corner. There was no grass nor the green shade of any tree. A brown and stony plain, burnt by the sun, and built upon it a straggling narrow city of hovels, crawling with vermin and poisoned with disease. Between the prison and the Nile no houses stood, and at this time the prisoners were allowed, so long as daylight lasted, to stumble in their chains down the half-mile of broken sloping earth to the Nile bank, so that they might draw water for their use and perform their ablutions. For the native, or the negro, then, escape was not so difficult. For along that bank the dows were moored, and they were numerous. The river traffic, such as there was of it, had its harbor there, and the wide foreshore made a convenient market-place. Thus the open space between the river and the house of stone was thronged and clamorous all day. Captives rubbed elbows with their friends, concerted plans of escape, or then and there slipped into the thickest of the crowd and made their way to the first blacksmith, with whom the price of iron outweighed any risk he took. But even on their way to the blacksmith's shop, their fetters called for no notice in Omdurman. Slaves wore them as a daily habit, and hardly a street in all that long brown treeless squalid city was ever free from the clink of a man who walked in chains. But for the Europeans, escape was another matter. There were not so many white prisoners, but that each was a marked man. Besides relays of camels stationed through the desert, much money, long preparations, and above all, devoted natives who would risk their lives were the first necessities for their evasion. The camels might be procured and stationed, but it did not follow that their drivers would remain at the stations. The long preparations might be made, and the whip of the jailer overset them at the end by flogging the captive within an inch of his life, on a suspicion that he had money. The devoted servant might shirk at the last moment. Colonel Trench began to lose all hope. His friends were working for him, he knew, for at times the boy who brought his food into the prison would bid him be ready. At times, too, when at some parade of the Khalifa's troops, he was shown in triumph as an emblem of the destiny of all the Turks. A man, perhaps, would jostle against his camel and whisper encouragements. But nothing ever came of the encouragements. 
he saw the sun rise daily beyond the bend of the river behind the tall palm trees of khartoum and burn across the sky and the months dragged one after the other on an evening towards the end of august in that year when durrance came home blind from the soudan he sat in a corner of the enclosure watching the sun drop westward towards the plain with an agony of anticipation for however intolerable the heat and burden of the day it was as nothing compared with the horrors which each night renewed the moment of twilight came and with it idris e sair the great negro of the gawama tribe and his fellow jailers into the house of stone he cried praying and cursing with the sound of the pitiless whips falling perpetually upon the backs of the hindmost the prisoners jostled and struggled at the narrow entrance to the prison house already it was occupied by some thirty captives lying upon the swamped mud floor or supported against the wall in the last extremities of weakness and disease two hundred more were driven in at night and pinned there till morning the room was perhaps thirty feet square of which four feet were occupied by a solid pillar supporting the roof there was no window in the building a few small apertures near the roof made a pretence of giving air and into this foul and pestilent hovel the prisoners were packed screaming and fighting the door was closed upon them utter darkness replaced the twilight so that a man could not distinguish even the outlines of the heads of the neighbors who wedged him in colonel trench fought like the rest there was a corner near the door which he coveted at that moment with a greater fierceness of desire than he had ever felt in the days when he had been free once in that corner he would have some shelter from the blows the stamping feet the bruises of his neighbor's shackles he would have too a support against which to lean his back during the ten interminable hours of suffocation if i were to fall if i were to fall that fear was always with him when he was driven in at night it worked in him like a drug producing madness for if a man once went down amid that yelling struggling throng he never got up again he was trampled out of shape trench had seen such victims dragged from the prison each morning and he was a small man therefore he fought for his corner in a frenzy like a wild beast kicking with his fetters thrusting with his elbows diving under this big man's arm burrowing between two others tearing at their clothes, using his nails, his fist, and even striking at heads with the chain which dangled from the iron ring about his neck. He reached the corner in the inn, streaming with heat and gasping for breath. The rest of the night he would spend in holding it against all comers. If I were to fall, he gasped, oh God, if I were to fall. And he shouted aloud to his neighbor, for in that clamor nothing less than a shout was audible. "'Is it you, Ibrahim?' And a like shout answered him, "'Yes, Effendi!' Trench felt some relief. Between Ibrahim, a great tall Arab of the Haddendos, and Trench, a friendship born of their common necessity had sprung up. There were no prison rations at Amdurman. Each captive was dependent upon his own money or the charity of his friends outside to trench from time to time there came money from his friends brought secretly into the prison by a native who had come up from assawan or suakin but there were long periods during which no help came to him and he lived upon the charity of the greeks who had sworn conversion to the modest faith or starved with such patience as he could there were times too when ibrahim had no friend to send him his meal into the prison and thus each man helped the other in his need they stood side by side against the wall at night yes effendi i am here 
and groping with his hand in the black darkness, he steadied Trench against the wall. A fight of even more than common violence was raging in an extreme corner of the prison, and so closely packed were the prisoners that with each advance of one combatant and retreat of the other, the whole jostled crowd swayed in a sort of rhythm, from end to end, from side to side, but they swayed, fighting to keep their feet, fighting even with their teeth, and above the din and noise of their hard breathing, the clank of their chains, and their imprecations, there rose now and then a wild sobbing cry for mercy, or an inhuman shriek, stifled as soon as uttered, which showed that a man had gone down beneath the stamping feet. Missiles, too, were flung across the prison, even to the foul earth gathered from the floor, and since none knew from what quarter they were flung, heads were battered against heads in the effort to avoid them, and all these things happened in the blackest darkness. For two hours Trench stood in that black prison, ringing with noise, rank with heat, and there were eight hours to follow before the door would be opened, and he could stumble into the clean air and fall asleep in the Zarebi. He stood upon tiptoe that he might lift his head above his fellows, but even so he could barely breathe, and the air he breathed was moist and sour. His throat was parched, his tongue was swollen in his mouth and stringy like a dried fig. It seemed to him that the imagination of God could devise no worse hell than the house of stone on an August night in Omdurman. It could add fire, he thought, but only fire. If I were to fall, he cried, and as he spoke, his hell was made perfect, for the door was opened. Idris S. Sayer appeared in the opening. Make room, he cried, make room, and he threw fire among the prisoners to drive them from the door. Lighted turfs of dried grass blazed in the darkness, and they fell upon the bodies of the prisoners. The captives were so crowded they could not avoid the missiles. In places, even, they could not lift their hands to dislodge them from their shoulders or their heads. "'Make room!' cried Idris. The whips of his fellow jailers enforced his command. The lashes fell upon all within reach, and a little space was cleared within the door. Into that space a man was flung, and the door closed again. Trench was standing close to the door. In the dim twilight which came through the doorway, he had caught a glimpse of the new prisoner. A man, heavily ironed, slight of figure, and bent with suffering. He will fall, he said. He will fall tonight. God, if I were to. And suddenly the crowd swayed against him, and the curses rose louder and shriller than before. The new prisoner was the cause. He clung to the door with his face against the panels, through the chinks of which actual air might come. Those behind plucked him from his vantage, jostled him, pressed him backwards that they might take his place. He was driven as a wedge is driven by a hammer between this prisoner and that, until at last he was flung against Colonel Trench. The ordinary instincts of kindness could not live in the nightmare of that prison house. In the daytime, outside, the prisoners were often drawn together by their bond of a common misery. The faithful, as often as not, helped the infidel. But to fight for life during the hours of darkness without pity or cessation was the one creed and practice of the House of Stone. Colonel Trench was like the rest. The need to live, if only long enough to drink one drop of water in the morning, and draw one clean mouthful of fresh air, was more than uppermost in his mind. It was the only thought he had. "'Back!' he cried violently. "'Back, or I strike!' And as he wrestled to lift his arm above his head that he might strike the better, he heard the man who had been flung against him incoherently babbling English. "'Don't fall!' cried Trench, and he caught his fellow captive by the arm. Ibrahim, help, God, if he were to fall. And while the crowd swayed again, 
and the shrill cries and curses rose again, deafening the ears, piercing the brain, Trench supported his companion, and bending down his head, caught again after so many months the accent of his own tongue, and the sound of it civilized him like the friendship of a woman. He could not hear what was said, the din was too loud, but he caught, as it were, shadows of words, which had once been familiar to him, which had been spoken to him, which he had spoken to others, as a matter of course. In the house of stone they sounded most wonderful. They had a magic, too. Meadows of grass, cool skies, and limpid rivers rose in gray, quiet pictures before his mind. For a moment he was insensible to his parched throat, to the stench of that prison house, to the oppressive blackness. But he felt the man whom he supported totter and slip, and again he cried to Ibrahim. If he were to fall, Ibrahim helped as only he could. Together they fought and wrestled until those about them yielded, crying, Shaitan, they're mad! They cleared a space in that corner, and setting the Englishman down upon the ground, they stood in front of him lest he should be trampled and behind him, on the ground, Trench heard every now and then, in a lull of the noise, the babble of English. "'He will die before morning,' he cried to Ibrahim. "'He is in a fever.' "'Sit beside him,' said the head and door. "'I can keep them back.' Trench stooped and squatted in the corner. Ibrahim set his legs well apart, and guarded Trench and his new friend. Bending his head, Trench could now hear the words. They were the words of a man in delirium, spoken in a voice of great pleading. He was telling some tale of the sea, it seemed. I saw the riding lights of the yacht, and the reflections shortening and lengthening as the water rippled. There was a band, too, as we passed the pierhead. What was it playing? Not the overture, and I don't think that I remember any other tune and he laughed with a crazy chuckle. I was always pretty bad at appreciating music, wasn't I? Except when you played. And again he came back to the sea. There was the line of hills upon the right as the boat steamed out of the bay. You remember, there were woods on the hillside. Perhaps you have forgotten. Then came Bray, a little fairy land of lights, close down by the water, at the point of the ridge. You remember Bray. We lunched there once or twice, just you and I, before everything was settled. It seemed strange to be steaming out of Dublin Bay and leaving you a long way off to the north, among the hills. Strange, and somehow not quite right, for that was the word you used when the morning came behind the blinds. It is not right that one should suffer so much pain. The engines didn't stop, though. They just kept throbbing and revolving and clanking, as though nothing had happened whatever. One felt a little angry about that. The fairyland was already only a sort of golden blob behind, and then nothing but sea and the salt wind and the things to be done. The man in his delirium suddenly lifted himself upon an elbow, and with the other hand fumbled in his breast as though he searched for something. Yes, the thing's to be done, he repeated in a mumbling voice, and he sank to unintelligible whisperings, with his head fallen upon his breast. Trench put an arm about him and raised him up, but he could do nothing more, and even to him, crouched as he was close to the ground, the noisome heat was almost beyond endurance. In front, the din of shrill voices, the screams for pity, the swaying and struggling went on in that appalling darkness. In one corner there were men singing in a mad frenzy. In another a few danced in their fetters, or rather tried to dance. In front of Trench, Ibrahim maintained his guard, and beside Trench there lay in the house of stone, in the town beyond the world, a man who one night had sailed out of Dublin Bay past the riding lanterns of the yachts, and had seen Bray, that fairyland of lights, dwindling to a golden blob. To think of the sea and the salt wind, 
the sparkle of lights as the water split at the ship's bows, the illuminated deck, perhaps the sound of a bell telling the hour, and the cool, dim night about and above, so wrought upon Trench that, practical, unimaginative creature as he was, for very yearning he could have wept. But the stranger at his side began to speak again. It is funny that those three faces were always the same, the man in the tent with the lancet in his hand, and the man in the back room off Piccadilly, and mine, funny and not quite right. No, I don't think that was quite right either. They get quite big, too, just when you are going to sleep in the dark, quite big, and they come very close to you and won't go away. They rather frighten one and he suddenly clung to Trench with a close, nervous grip like a boy in an extremity of fear. And it was in the tone of reassurance that a man might use to a boy that Trench replied, It's all right, old man, it's all right. But Trench's companion was already relieved of his fear. He had come out of his boyhood and was rehearsing some interview which was to take place in the future. Will you take it back? he asked with a great deal of hesitation and timidity. Really? The others have, all except the man who died at Tamai. And you will, too? He spoke as though he could hardly believe some piece of great good fortune which had befallen him. Then his voice changed to that of a man belittling his misfortunes. Oh, it hasn't been the best of times, of course. But then one didn't expect the best of times and at the worst one always had the afterwards to look forward to. Supposing one didn't run, I'm not sure that when the whole thing's balanced it won't come out that you have really had the worst time. I know you. It would hurt you through and through, pride and heart and everything, for a long time, just as much as it hurt that morning, when the daylight came through the blinds, and you couldn't do anything. And you haven't the afterward to help you. You weren't looking forward to it all the time as I was. It was all over and done with for you. And he lapsed again into mutterings. Colonel Trench's delight at the sound of his native tongue had now given place to a great curiosity as to the man who spoke and what he said. Trench had described himself a long while ago as he stood opposite the cab stand in the southwest corner of St. James Square, I am an inquisitive, methodical person, he had said, and he had not described himself amiss. Here was a life history, it seemed, being unfolded to his ears, and not the happiest of histories, perhaps, indeed with something of tragedy at the heart of it. Trench began to speculate upon the meaning of that word afterwards which came and went among the words like the motif in a piece of music, and very likely it was the life motif of the man who spoke them. In the prison the heat became stifling, the darkness more oppressive, but the cries and shouts were dying down, their volume was less great, their intonations less shrill, stupor and fatigue and exhaustion were having their effect. Trench bent his head again to his companion, and now heard more clearly. I saw your light that morning. You put it out suddenly. Did you hear my step on the gravel? I thought you did. It hurt rather. And then he broke out into an emphatic protest. No, no, I had no idea that you would wait. I had no wish that you should. Afterwards, perhaps, I thought, but nothing more. Upon my word, Stutch was quite wrong. Of course, there was always the chance that one might come to grief oneself, get killed, you know, or fall ill and die before one asked you to take your feather back, and then there wouldn't even have been a chance of the afterwards. But that is the risk one had to take. The illusion was not direct enough for Colonel Trench's comprehension. He heard the word feather, but he could not connect it as yet with any action of his own. He was more curious than ever about that afterwards. He began to have a glimmering of its meaning. 
and he was struck with wonderment at the thought of how many men there were going about the world with a calm and commonplace demeanor beneath which were hidden quaint fancies and poetic beliefs never to be so much as suspected until illness deprived the brain of its control no one of the reasons why i never said anything that night to you about what i intended was i think that i did not wish you to wait or have any suspicion of what i was going to attempt and then expostulation ceased and he began to speak in a tone of interest do you know it has only occurred to me since i came to the soudan but i believe that durrance cared the name came with something of a shock upon trench's ears the man knew durrance he was not merely a stranger of trench's blood but he knew durrance even as trench knew him there was a link between them they had a friend in common he knew durrance had fought in the same square with him perhaps at toker or tamai or tamanib just as trench had done and so trench's curiosity as to the life history in its turn gave place to a curiosity as to the identity of the man he tried to see knowing that in that black and noisome hovel sight was impossible he might hear though enough to be assured for if the stranger knew durrance it might be that he knew trench as well trench listened the sound of the voice high-pitched and rambling told him nothing he waited for the words and the words came durrance stood at the window after i had told them about you ethne and trench repeated the name to himself it was to a woman then that his new-found compatriot this friend of durrance in his delirium imagined himself to be speaking a woman named ethne trench could recall no such name but the voice in the dark went on all the time when i was proposing to send in my papers after the telegram had come he stood at the window of my rooms with his back to me looking out across the park i fancied he blamed me but i think now he was making up his mind to lose you i wonder Trench uttered so startled an exclamation that Ibrahim turned around. Is he dead? No, he lives, he lives. It was impossible, Trench argued. He remembered quite clearly Durant standing by a window with his back to the room. He remembered a telegram coming, which took a long while in the reading, which diffused among all except Durant's an inexplicable suspense. He remembered, too, a man who spoke of his betrothal, and of sending in his papers. But surely this could not be the man. Was the woman's name Ethne? A woman of Donegal, yes. And this man had spoken of sailing out of Dublin Bay. He had spoken, too, of a feather. Good God, whispered Trench. Was the name Ethne? Was it? Was it? But for a while he received no answer. He heard only talk of a mud-walled city and an intolerable sun burning upon a wide round of desert, and a man who lay there all day with his linen robe drawn over his head, and slowly drew one face toward him across three thousand miles, until at sunset it was near, and he took courage and went down into the gate, and after that four words stabbed Trench. Three little white feathers were the words. Trench leaned back against the wall. It was he who had devised that message. Three little white feathers, the voice repeated. This afternoon we were under the elms down by the Linden River. Do you remember, Harry, just you and I? And then came three little white feathers, and the world's at an end. Trench had no longer any doubts. The man was quoting words and words, no doubt spoken by this girl Ethne, on the night when the three feathers came. Harry, she had said. Do you remember, Harry? Trench was certain. Feathersham, he cried, Feathersham, and he shook the man whom he held in his arms and called to him again. Under the elms by the Lennon River, visions of green shade touched with gold and of the sunlight flickering between the leaves caught at Trench 
and drew him like a mirage in that desert of which Feathersham had spoken. Feathersham had been under the elms of the Lennon River on that afternoon before the feathers came, and he was in the house of stone at Omdurman. But why? Trench asked himself the question, and was not spared the answer. Willoughby took his feather back, and upon that Feversham broke off, his voice rambled. He seemed to be running somewhere amid sandhills, which continually shifted and danced about him as he ran, so that he could not tell which way he went. He was in the last stage of fatigue, too, so that his voice in his delirium became querulous and weak. Abu Fadma, he cried, and the cry was the cry of a man whose throat is parched and whose limbs fail beneath him. Abu Fatma, Abu Fatma. He stumbled as he ran, picked himself up, ran and stumbled again, and about him the deep soft sand piled itself into pyramids, built itself into long slopes and ridges, and leveled itself flat with an extraordinary and a malicious rapidity. Abu Fatma cried Feversham, and he began to argue in a weak, obstinate voice. I know the wells are here, close by, within half a mile. I know they are. I know they are. The clue to that speech Trench had not got. He knew nothing of Feathersham's adventure at Berber. He could not tell that the wells were the wells of Obak, or that Feathersham, tired with the hurry of his traveling, and after a long day's march without water, had lost his way among the shifting sand hills but he did know that Willoughby had taken back his feather, and he made a guess as to the motive which had brought Feathersham now to the House of Stone. Even on that point, however, he was not to remain in doubt, for in a while he heard his own name upon Feathersham's lips. Remorse seized upon Colonel Trench. The sending of the feathers had been his invention and his alone. He could not thrust the responsibility of his invention upon either Willoughby or Castleton. It was just his doing. He had thought it rather a shrewd and clever stroke, he remembered at the time, a vengeance eminently just. Eminently just, no doubt it was, but he had not thought of the woman. He had not imagined that she might be present when the feathers came. He had indeed almost forgotten the episode. He had never speculated upon the consequences, and now they rose up and smoked the smiter. And his remorse was to grow, for the night was not nearly at its end. All through the dark, slow hours he supported Feathersham and heard him talk. Now Feathersham was lurking in the bazaar at Suakin, and during the siege. During the siege, thought Trench. While we were there, then... He was herding with the camel drivers in the bazaar, learning their tongues, watching for his chance. Three years of it. At another moment, Feathersham was slinking up the Nile to Wadi Halfa with a zither, in the company of some itinerant musicians, hiding from any who might remember him and accuse him with his name. Trench heard of a man slipping out from Wadi Halfa, crossing the Nile, and wandering with the assumed manner of a lunatic southwards, starving and waterless, until one day he was snapped up by a modest caravan and dragged to Dongola as a spy. And at Dongola things had happened of which the mere mention made Trench shake. He heard of leather cords which had been bound about the prisoner's wrist and upon which water had been poured until the cords swelled and the wrist burst. But this was among the minor brutalities. Trench waited for the morning as he listened, wondering whether indeed it would ever come. He heard the bolts drag back at the last. He saw the door open and the good daylight. He stood up and with Ibrahim's help, protected this new comrade until the eager rush was past. Then he supported him out into the Zariba. Worn, wasted in body and face, with a rough beer straggled upon his chin, and his eyes all sunk and very bright, it was still Harry Feathersham. 
Trench laid him down in a corner of the Zariba, where there would be shade, and in a few hours shade would be needed. Then, with the rest, he scrambled to the Nile for water and brought it back. As he poured it down Feathersham's throat, Feathersham seemed for a moment to recognize him. But it was only for a moment, and the incoherent tale of his adventures began again. Thus, after five years, and for the first time since Trench had dined as Feathersham's guest in the high rooms overlooking St. James Park, the two men met in the House of Stone. End of chapter 27《Chapter Twenty Eight of the Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Oldman. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Plans of Escape. For three days, Feversham rambled and wandered in his talk and for three days Trench fetched him water from the Nile, shared his food with him, and ministered to his wants. For three nights, too, he stood with Ibrahim and fought in front of Feversham in the House of Stone. But on the fourth morning, Feversham waked to his senses and, looking up with his own eyes, saw bending over him the face of Trench. At first the face seemed part of his delirium. It was one of those nightmare faces which had used to grow big and had come so horribly close to him in the dark nights of his boyhood as he lay in bed. He put out a weak arm and thrust it aside, but he gazed about him. He was lying in the shadow of the prison house, and the hard blue sky above him, the brown bare trampled soil on which he lay, and the figures of his fellow prisoners dragging their chains or lying prone upon the ground in some extremity of sickness, gradually conveyed their meaning to him. He turned to Trench, caught at him as if he feared the next moment would snatch him out of reach, and then he smiled. I am in the prison at Omdurman, he said, actually in the prison. This is Om Haga, the house of stone. It seems too good to be true. He leaned back against the wall with an air of extreme relief. To Trench, the words, the tone of satisfaction in which they were uttered, sounded like some sardonic piece of irony. A man who plumed himself upon indifference to pain and pleasure, who posed as a being of so much experience that joy and trouble could no longer stir a pulse or cause a frown, and who carried his pose to perfection. Such a man, thought Trench, might have uttered Feversham's words in Feversham's voice, but Feversham was not that man. His delirium had proved it. The satisfaction, then, was genuine, the words sincere. The peril of Dongola was past. He had found Trench. He was in Omdurman. That prison house was his longed-for goal, and he had reached it. He might have been dangling on a gibbet hundreds of miles away, down the stream of the Nile, with the vultures perched upon his shoulders, the purpose for which he lived quite unfulfilled. But he was in the enclosure of the House of Stone in Omdurman. You have been here a long while, he said. Three years. Feversham looked round the Tsar Reba. Three years of it, he murmured. I was afraid that I might not find you alive. Trench nodded. The nights are the worst. The nights in here. It's a wonder any man lives through a week of them. Yet I have lived through a thousand nights, and even to him who had endured them, his endurance seemed incredible. A thousand nights in the house of stone, he exclaimed. But we may go down to the Nile by daytime, said Feversham, and he started up with alarm as he gazed at the thorn Zariba. Surely we are allowed so much liberty. I was told so, an Arab at Wadi Halfa told me. And it's true, returned Trench. Look, he pointed to the earthen bowl of water at his side. I filled that at the Nile this morning. I must go, said Feversham, and he lifted himself up from the ground. I must go this morning. And since he spoke with a raised voice and a manner of excitement, Trench whispered to him. 
Hush, there are many prisoners here, and among them many tale-bearers. Feversham sank back on to the ground as much from weakness as in obedience to Trench's warning. But they cannot understand what we say, he objected in a voice from which the excitement had suddenly gone. They can see that we talk together and earnestly. Idris would know of it within the hour. The Khalifa before sunset. There would be heavier fetters and the corbatch if we spoke at all. Lie still. You are weak and I too am very tired. We will sleep and later in the day we will go together down to the Nile. Trent lay down beside Feversham and in a moment was asleep. Feversham watched him and saw, now that his features were relaxed, the marks of those three years very plainly in his face. It was towards noon before he awoke. There is no one to bring you food, he asked, and Feversham answered. Yes, a boy should come. He should bring news as well. They waited until the gate of the Zariba was opened, and the friends or wives of the prisoners entered. At once that enclosure became a cage of wild beasts. The gaolers took their dole at the outset. Little more of the acida, that moist and pounded bread of dura, which was the staple diet of the town, then was sufficient to support life, was allowed to reach the prisoners. And even for that, the strong fought with the weak, and the group of four did battle with the group of three. From every corner, men gaunt and thin as skeletons hopped and leaped as quickly as the weight of their change would allow them towards the entrance. Here, one week with starvation tripped and fell and once fallen lay prone in the stolid despair, knowing that for him there would be no meal that day. Others seized upon the messengers who brought the food and tore it from their hands. Though the whips of the gaolers laid their backs open, there were thirty gaolers to guard that enclosure, each armed with his rhinoceros hide corbatch but this was the one moment in each day when the corbatch was neither feared nor as it seemed felt among the food bearers a boy sheltered himself behind the rest and gazed irresolutely about the zareba it was not long however before he was detected he was knocked down and his food snatched from his hands but the boy had his lungs and his screams brought idiris essaya himself upon the three men who had attacked him. For whom do you come, he asked Idris, as he thrust the prisoners aside. For Giuseppe, the Greek, answered the boy, and as Idris pointed to the corner where Feversham lay. The boy advanced, holding out his empty hands, as though explaining how it was that he brought no food. When he came quite close, and squatting at Feversham's side, continued to explain with words and as he spoke he loosed a gazelle skin which was fastened about his waist beneath his jibber and he let it fall by feversham's side the gazelle skin contained a chicken and upon that feversham and trench breakfasted and dined and supped an hour later they were allowed to pass out of the zareba and make their way to the nile they walked slowly and with many halts and during one of these trench said we can talk here. Below them, at the water's edge, some of the prisoners were unloading dows. Others were paddling knee-deep in the muddy water. The shore was crowded with men screaming and shouting and excited for no reason whatever. The gaolers were within view, but not within earshot. Yes, we can talk here. Why have you come? I was captured in the desert on the Arbane Road, said Feversham slowly yes masquerading as a lunatic musician who had wandered out of the wadi hafa with a zither i know but you were captured by your own deliberate wish you came to join me in Amdurman. i know how do you know you told me during the last three days you have told me much and feversham looked about him suddenly in alarm very much continued trench you came to join me because five years ago i sent you a white feather and was that all I told you? asked Feversham anxiously. No, Trench replied, and he dragged out the word. He sat up while Feversham lay on his side, and he looked towards the Nile in front of him, 
holding his head between his hands so that he could not see or be seen by feversham no that was not all you spoke of a girl the same girl of whom you spoke when willoughby and durrance and i dined with you in london a long while ago i know her name now her christian name she was with you when the feathers came i had not thought of that possibility she gave you a fourth feather to add to our three i am sorry there was a silence of some length and then feversham replied slowly for my part i am not sorry i mean i am not sorry that she was present when the feathers came i think on the whole that i am rather glad she gave me the fourth feather it is true but i am glad of that as well for without her presence without that fourth feather snapped from her fan i might have given up there and then who knows i doubt if i could have stood up to the three long years in swakin i used to see you and durrance and willoughby and many men who had once been my friends and you were all going about the work which i was used to you can't think how the mere routine of a regiment to which one had become accustomed and which one cursed heartily enough when one had to put up with it appealed to something very desirable i could so easily have slipped on to a boat and gone back to suez and the chance for which i waited never came for three years you saw us said trench and you gave no sign how would you have taken it if i had and trench was silent no i saw you but i was careful that you should not see me i doubt if i could have endured it without the recollection of that night at ramelton without the feel of the fourth feather to keep the recollection actual and recent in my thoughts i should never have gone down from obak into berber i should certainly never have joined you in Omdurman. trench turned quickly towards his companion she would be glad to hear you say that he said i have no doubt she is sorry about her fourth feather sorry as i am about the other three there is no reason that she should be or that you either should be sorry i don't blame you or her and in his turn feversham was silent and looked towards the river the air was shrill with cries the shore was thronged with a motley of arabs and negroes dressed in their long robes of blue and yellow and dirty brown the work of unloading the dows went busily on across the river and beyond its fork the palm trees of khartoum stood up against the cloudless sky and the sun behind them was moving down to the west in a few hours would come the horrors of the house of stone but they were both thinking of the elms by the lennon river and a hall of which the door stood open to the cool night and which echoed softly to the music of a waltz while a girl and a man stood with three white feathers fallen upon the floor between them the one man recollected the other imagined the picture and to both of them it was equally vivid feversham smiled at last perhaps she has now seen willoughby perhaps she has now taken his feather trench held out his hand to his companion i will take mine back now feversham shook his head no not yet and trench's face suddenly lighted up a hope which had struggled up in his hopeless breast during the next three days and nights of his watch a hope which he had striven to repress for very fear lest it might prove false sprang to life not yet then you have a plan for our escape and the anxiety returned to feversham's face i said nothing of it he pleaded tell me that when i was delirious in a prison there i said nothing of it i breathed no word of it i told you of the four feathers i told you of ethne but of the plan for your escape i said nothing not a single word so that i myself was in doubt and did not dare to believe and feversham's anxiety died away he had spoken with his hand trembling upon trench's arm and his voice itself had trembled with alarm you see if i spoke of that in the house of stone he exclaimed i might have spoken of it in dongola for in dongola as well as Omdurman, i was delirious but i didn't you say not here at all events so perhaps not there either 
I was afraid that I should. How I was afraid. There was a woman in Dongola who spoke some English, very little but enough. She had been in Cornisa of Khartoum when Gordon ruled there. She was sent to question me. I had unhappy times in Dongola. Trench interrupted him in a low voice. I know. You told me things which made me shiver. And he caught hold of Feversham's arm and thrust the loose sleeve back. Feversham's scarred wrists confirmed the tale. Well, I felt myself getting lightheaded there, he went on. I made up my mind that of your escape I must let no hint slip. So I tried to think of something else with all my might when I was going off my head and he laughed a little to himself. That was why you heard me talk of Ethne, he explained. Trench sat nursing his knees and looking straight in front of him. He had paid no heed to Feversham's last words. He had dared now to give his hopes their way. So it's true, he said in a quiet, wondering voice. There will be a morning when we shall not drag ourselves out of the house of stone. There will be nights when we shall sleep in beds, actually in beds. There will be... He stopped with a short of shy air, like a man upon the brink of a confession. There will be something more, he said lamely, and then he got up onto his feet. We have sat here too long. Let us go forward. They moved a hundred yards nearer to the river and sat down again. You have more than a hope. You have a plan of escape, Trench asked eagerly. More than a plan, returned Feversham. The preparations are made. There are camels waiting in the desert ten miles west of Omdurman. Now? exclaimed Trench. Now? Yes, man, now. There are rifles and ammunitions buried near the camels. Provisions and water kept in readiness. We travel by Metame, where fresh camels wait from Metame to Berber. There we will cross the Nile. Camels are waiting for us five miles from Berber. From Berber we ride in over the Kokrib Pass to Suakin. When? exclaimed Trench. Oh, when? When? When I have strength enough to sit a horse for ten miles and a camel for a week, answered Feversham. How soon will that be? Not long, Trench. I promise you. Not long. And he rose up from the ground. As you get up, he continued, glance around. You will see a man in a blue linen dress loitering between us and the goal. As we came past me, he made me a sign. I did not return it. I shall return it on a day when we escape. He will wait for a month. We must manage on one night during that month to escape from the house of stone. We can signal him to bring help. A passage might be made in one night through that wall. The stones are loosely built. They walked a little further and came to the water's edge. There, amid the crowd, they spoke again of their escape, but with the air of men amused at what went on about them. There is a better way than breaking through the wall, said Trench. And he uttered a laugh as he spoke and pointed to a prisoner with a great load upon his back, who had fallen upon his face in the water and encumbered by his fetters, pressed down by his load, was vainly struggling to lift himself again. There is a better way. You have money? Aye, aye, shouted Feversham, roaring with laughter, as the prisoner half rose and soused again. I have some concealed on me. I dearest took what I did not conceal. Good, said Trench. Idris will come to you today or tomorrow. He will talk to you of the goodness of Allah, who has brought you out of the wickedness of the world to the holy city of Omdurman. He will tell you at great length of the peril of your soul and of the only means of inverting it, and he will wind up with a few significant sentences about his starving family. If you come to the aid of his starving family and bid him keep for himself fifteen dollars out of the amount he took from you, he may get permission to sleep in the Zariba, outside the prison. Be content with that for a night or two. Then he will come to you again, and again you assist his starving family, and this time you will ask for permission for me to sleep in the open too. Come, 
is Eridus shepherding us home. It fell out as Trench had predicted. Eridus read Feversham an abnormally long lecture that afternoon. Feversham learned that now God loved him and how Hicks Pasha's army had been destroyed. The holy angels had done that. Not a single shot was fired, not a single spear thrown by the Mahdi's soldiers. The spears flew from their hands by the angels' guidance and pierced the unbelievers. Feversham heard for the first time of a most convenient spirit. Nebi Kedar, who was the caliph's eyes and ears, and reported to him all that went on in the gold. It was pointed out to Feversham that if Nebi Kedar reported against him, he would have heavier shackles, riveted upon his feet and many unpleasant things would happen at last came the exordium about the starving children and feverish and begged ear dust to take fifteen dollars trench's plan succeeded that night feverish slept in the open and two nights later trench lay down beside him overhead was a clear sky and the blazing stars only three more days said feverish and he heard his companion draw in a long breath. For a while they laid side by side in silence, breathing the cool night air, and then Trent said, Are you awake? Yes. Well, with some hesitation he made that confidence which he had repressed on the day when they sat upon the foreshore of the Nile. Each man has his particular weak spots of sentiment, I suppose. I have mine. I am not a marrying man so it's not sentiment of that kind perhaps you will laugh at it it isn't merely that i loathe his squalid shadeless vile town of omdurman or the horrors of its prison it isn't merely that i hate the emptiness of those desert weights it isn't merely that i'm sick of the palm trees of khartoum or these chains or the whips of the golas but there's something more i want to die at home I have been desperately afraid so often that I should die here. I want to die at home, not merely in my own country, but in my own village and be buried there under the trees. I know in the sight of the church and the houses, I know, and the trout stream where I fished when I was a boy, you'll laugh, no doubt. Feversham was not laughing. The words had a queer ring of familiarity to him, and he knew why. They never had actually been spoken to him but they might have been and by ethne eustace no i am not laughing he answered i understand and he spoke with a warmth of tone which rather surprised trench and indeed an actual friendship sprang up between the two men and it dated from that night it was a fit moment for confidences lying side by side in that enclosure they made them one to the other in low voices the shouts and yells came muffled from within the house of stone and gave to them both a feeling that they were well off they could breathe they could see no low roof oppressed them they were in the cool of the night air that night air would be very cold before morning and wake them to shiver in their rags and huddle together in their corner but at present they lay comfortably upon their backs and with their hands clasped behind their heads and watched the great stars and planets burn in the blue dome of sky it will be strange to find them dim and small again said trench there will be compensations answered feversham with a laugh and they fell to making plans of what they would do when they had crossed the desert and the mediterranean and the continent of Europe and had come to their own country of dim small stars fascinated and enthralled by the pictures which the simplest sentence the most commonplace phrase through the magic of its associations was able to evoke in their minds they let the hours slip by unnoticed there were no longer prisoners in that barbarous town which lay a murky stain upon the solitary wide spaces of sand they were in their own land following their old pursuits they were standing outside clumps of trees guns in their hands while a sharp cry mark mark came to their ears 
trench heard again the unmistakable rattle of the reel of his fishing rod as he wound in his line upon the bank of his trout stream they talked of theatres in london and the last plays which they had seen the last books which they had read six years ago there goes the great bear said trench suddenly it is late the tail of the constellation was dipping behind the thorn hedge of the zareba they turned over on their sides three more days said trench only three more days feversham replied in a minute they were neither in england nor the sudan the stars marched to the morning unnoticed above the head they were lost in the pleasant countries of sleep end of chapter twenty eight Chapter Twenty Nine of the Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Oldman. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Colonel Trench assumes a knowledge of chemistry. Three more days. Both men fell asleep with these words upon their lips but the next morning trench waked up and complained of a fever and the fever rapidly gained upon him so that before the afternoon had come he was light-headed and those services which he had performed for feversham feversham had now to perform for him the thousand knights of the house of stone had done their work but it was no mere coincidence that trench should suddenly be struck down by them at the very moment when the door of his prison was opening the great revulsion of joy which had come to him so unexpectedly had been too much for his exhausted body the actual prospect of escape had been the crowning trial which he could not endure in a few days he will be well said feversham it is nothing it is on saba answered ibrahim shaking his head the terrible typhus fever which has struck down so many in that infected goal and carried them off upon the seventh day feversham refused to believe it is nothing he repeated it in a sort of passionate obstinacy but in his mind there ran another question will the men with the camels wait each day as he went to the nile he saw abu fatma in the blue robe at his post each day the man made a sign and each day Feversham gave him no answer. Meanwhile, with Ibrahim's help, he nursed Trench. The boy came daily to the prison with food. He was sent out to buy tamarinds, dates, and roots, out of which Ibrahim brewed cooling draughts. Together they carried Trench from shade to shade as the sun moved across the Tsar Reba. Some further assistance was provided for the starving family of Idris, and the forty-pound chains which Trench wore were consequently removed. He was given vegetable marrow soaked in salt water. His mouth was packed with butter, his body anointed and wrapped close in camel cloth. The fever took its course, and on the seventh day, Ibrahim said, This is the last. Tonight he will die. No, replied Feversham, that is impossible. In his own parish, he said, beneath the trees he knew, not here no and he spoke again with a passionate obstinacy he was no longer thinking of the man in the blue robe outside the prison walls or of the chances of escape the fear that the third feather would never be brought back to ethne that he would never have the opportunity to take back the fourth of her own free will no longer troubled him even that great hope of the afterwards was for the moment banished from his mind he thought only of trench and the few awkward words he had spoken in the corner of the zareba on the first night when they lay side by side under the sky no he repeated he must not die here and through all that day and night he watched by trench's side the long hard battle between life and death at one moment it seemed that the three years of the house of stone must win the victory at another that trench's strong constitution 
and wiry frame would get the better of the three years for that night at all events they did and the struggle was prolonged the dangerous seventh day was past even ibrahim began to gain hope and on the thirteenth day trench slept and did not ramble during his sleep and when he waked it was with a clear head he found himself alone and so swathed in camel cloth that he could not stir but the heat of day was past and the shadow of the house of stone lay black upon the sand of the zareba he had not any wish to stir and he lay wondering idly how long he had been ill while he wondered he heard the shouts of the gaolers and the cries of the prisoners outside the zareba and in the direction of the river the gate was open and the prisoners flocked in feversham was among them and he walked straight to strench's corner thank god he cried i would not have left you but i was compelled we have been unloading boats all day and he dropped in fatigue by trench's side how long have i lain ill asked trench thirteen days it will be a month before i can travel you must go feversham you must leave me here and go while you still can perhaps when you come to assawan you can do something for me i could not move at the present you will go to-morrow no i should not go without you in any case answered feversham as it is it is too late too late trench repeated he took in the meaning of the words but slowly he was almost reluctant to be disturbed by their mere sound he wished just to lie idle for a long time in the cool of the sunset but gradually the import of what feversham had said forced itself into his mind too late then the man in the blue gown has gone yes he spoke to me yesterday by the river the camel men would wait no longer they were afraid of detection and meant to return whether we went with them or not you should have gone with them said trench for himself he did not at that moment care whether he was to live in the prison all his life so long as he was allowed quietly to lie where he was for a long time and it was without expression of despair that he added so our one chance is lost no deferred replied feversham the man who watched by the river in the blue gown brought me a paper a pen and some wood soot mixed with water he was able to drop them by my side as i lay upon the ground i hid them beneath my jibber and last night there was a moon last night i wrote to a greek merchant who keeps a cafe at wadi halfa i gave him the letter this afternoon and he is gone he will deliver it and receive money in six months in a year at the latest he will be back in omdurman very likely said trench he will ask for another letter so that he may receive more money and again he will say that in six months or a year he will be back in Omdurman. I know these people. You do not know Abu Fatma. He was Gordon's servant over there before Khartoum fell. He has been mine since he came with me to Obak and waited there while I went down to Berber. He risked his life in coming to Omdurman at all. Within six months he will be back. You may be very sure. Trench did not continue the argument. He let his eyes wander about the enclosure, and they settled at last upon a pile of newly turned earth, which lay in one corner. What are they digging? he asked. A well, answered Feversham. A well, said Trench, fretfully, and so close to the Nile? Why? What's the object? I don't know, said Feversham. Indeed, he did not know, but he suspected. With a great fear at his heart, he suspected the reason why the well was being dug in the enclosure of the prison he would not however reveal his suspicion until his companion was strong enough to bear the disappointment which belief in it would entail but within a few days his suspicion was proved true it was openly announced that a high wall was to be built about the house of stones too many prisoners had escaped in their fetters along the nile bank henceforth they were to be kept from years beginning to year's end within the wall the prisoners built it themselves of mud bricks dried in the sun 
feverson took his share in the work and trench as soon almost as he could stand was joined with him here's our last hope gone he said and though feversham did not openly agree in spite of himself his heart began to consent they piled the bricks one upon the other and mortarized them each day the wall rose a foot with their own hands they closed themselves in twelve feet high the wall stood when they had finished it twelve foot high and smooth and strong there was never a projection from its surface on which a foot could rest it could not be broken through in at night trench and feversham contemplated it in despair the very palm trees of khartoum were now hidden from their eyes a square of bright blue by day a square of dark blue by night jewelled with points of silver and flashing gold limited their world trench covered his face with his hands i daren't look at it he said in a broken voice we have been building our own coffin feversham that's the truth of it and then he cast up his arms and cried aloud will they never come up the nile the gunboats and the soldiers have they forgotten us in england good god have they forgotten us hush replied feversham we shall find a way of escape never fear we must wait six months well we have both of us waited years six months what are they but though he spoke stoutly for his comrade's stake his own heart sank within him the details of their life during the six months are not to be dwelt upon in that pestilent enclosure only the myriad vermin lived lives of comfort no news filtered in from the world outside they fed upon their own thoughts so that the sight of a blizzard upon the wall became an occasion for excitement they were stung by scorpions at night there were at times flogged by their gaolers by day they lived at the mercy and the whims of idris es Salar and that peculiar spirit nebuchadnezzar who always reported against them to the khalifa just at the moment when Irdus was most in need of money for his starving family religious men were sent by the khalifa to convert them to the only true religion and indeed the long theological disputations in the enclosure became events to which both men looked forward with eagerness at one time they would be freed from the heavier shackles and allowed to sleep in the open and another without reason those privileges would be withdrawn and they struggled for their lives within the house of stone the six months came to an end the seventh began a fortnight of it passed and the boy who brought feverish and food could never cheer their hearts with word that abu fatma had come back he will never come said trench in despair surely he will if he is alive said feversham but is he alive the seventh month passed and one morning at the beginning of the eighth there came two of the khalifa's bodyguard to the prison who talked with idris idris advanced to the two prisoners verily god is good to you you men from the bad world he said you are to look upon the countenance of the khalifa how happy you should be trench and feversham rose up from the ground in no very happy frame of mind what does he want with us is this the end the question started up clear in both their minds they followed the two guards out through the door and up the street towards the khalifa's house does it mean death said feversham Trent shrugged his shoulders and laughed sourly. It is on the cards that Nebi Kadir has suggested something of the kind, he said. They were led into the great parade ground before the mosque and thence into the Khalifa's house, where another white man sat in attendance upon the threshold. Within the Khalifa was seated upon an angareb, and a gray-bearded Greek stood beside him the khalifa remarked to them that they were both to be employed upon the manufacture of gunpowder with which the armies of the turks were shortly to be overwhelmed feversham was on the point of disclaiming any knowledge of the process but before he could open his lips he heard trench declaring in fluid arabic 
that there was nothing connected with gunpowder that he did not know about and upon his words they were both told they were to be employed at the powder factory under the supervision of the greek for that greek both prisoners will entertain a regard to their dying day there was in the world a true samaritan it was out of sheer pity knowing the two men to be herded in the house of stone that he suggested to the khalifa their employment and the same pity taught him to cover the deficiencies of their knowledge i know nothing whatever about the making of gunpowder except the crystals of you said trench but we shall leave the prison each day and that is something though we return each night who knows when a chance of escape may come the powder factory lay in the northward part of the town and on the bank of the nile just beyond the limits of the great mud wall and at the back of the slave market every morning the two prisoners were let out from the prison door they tramped along the river bank on the outside of the town wall and came into the powder factory past the storehouses of the khalifa's bodyguard every evening they went back by the same road to the house of stone no guard was sent with them since flight seemed impossible and each journey that they made they looked anxiously for the man in a blue robe but the months pass and may brought with it the summer something has happened to abu fatma said feversham he has been caught at berber perhaps in some way he has been delayed he will not come said trench feversham can no longer pretend to hope that he would he did not know of a sword thrust received by abu fatma as he fled through the berber on his return from omdurman he did not know of a sword thrust received by abu fatma as he thread through berber on his return from omdurman he had been recognized by one of his old goalies in that town and had got cheaply off with the one thrust in his thigh from that wound he had through the greater part of this year been slowly recovering in the hospital at assuan but though Feversham heard nothing of a Abu Fatma, towards the end of May received news that others were working for his escape. As Trench and he passed in the dusk of one evening between the storehouses and the town wall, a man in the shadow of one of the narrow alleys which opened from the storehouse whispered to them to stop. Trench knelt down upon the ground and examined his foot as though a stone had cut it and as he kneeled the man walked past them and dropped a slip of paper at their feet he was a sawakin merchant who had a booth in the grain market of omdurman trench picked up the paper and hid it in his hand and limped on with feversham at his side there was no address or name upon the outside and as soon as they had left the houses behind and had only the wall upon their right and the knoll upon their left trench sat down again there was a crowd about the water's edge men passed up and down between the crowd and them trench took his foot into his lap examined the soul but at the same time he unfolded the paper in the hollow of his hand and read the contents aloud he could hardly read them his voice so trembled feversham could hardly hear him the blood so sang in his ears a man will bring you a box of matches when he comes trust him such and he asked who is such a great friend of mine said fever some he is in egypt then does he say where no but since muhammad ali the grain messen dropped the paper we may be sure he is at sawakin a man with a box of matches think we may meet him tonight but it was a month later when in the evening an arab pushed past them on the river bank and said i am the man with the matches tomorrow by the storehouse at this hour and as he walked past them he dropped a box of colored matches on the ground feversham stooped instantly don't touch them said trance and he pressed the box into the ground with his foot and walked on such exclaimed feversham so he comes to our house how did he know that i was here trench fairly shook with excitement as he walked he did not speak of the great new hope which so suddenly came to them for he dared not 
he tried even to pretend to himself that no message at all had come he was afraid to let his mind dwell upon the subject both men slept brokenly that night and every time they waked it was with a dim consciousness that something great and wonderful had happened feversham as he lay upon his back and gazed upward at the stars had a fancy that he had fallen asleep in the garden of broad place on the surrey hills and that he had but to raise his head to see the dark pines upon his right hand and his left but to look behind to see the gables of the house against the sky he fell asleep towards dawn and within an hour was waked up by a violent shaking he saw trench bending over him with a great fear on his face suppose they keep us in prison today he whispered in a shaking voice plucking at vivashin it has just occurred to me suppose they did that why should they answered Feversham. But the same fear caught hold of him, and they sat dreading the appearance of Idris, lest he should have some such new order to deliver. But Idris crossed the yard and unbolted the prison door without a look at them. Fighting, screaming, jammed together in the entrance, pulled back, thrust forward, the captives struggled out into the air, and among them was one who ran, foaming at the mouth, and dashing his head against the wall. He is mad, said Trench, as the Gola secured him, and since Trench was unmanned that morning, he began to speak rapidly and almost with incoherence. That's what I have feared, Feversham, that I should go mad, to die, even here. One could put up with that without overmuch regret, but to go mad, and he shivered. If this man with the matches proves false to us, Feversham, i shall be near to it very near to it a man one day a raving foaming idiot the next a thing to be put away out of sight out of hearing god but that's horrible and he dropped his head between his hands dared not look up until idris crossed to them and bade them go about their work what work they did in the factory that day neither knew they were only aware that the hours passed with an extraordinary slowness but the evening came at last among the storehouses said trench they dived into the first alley which they passed and turning a corner saw the man who had brought the matches i am abdul kadar he began at once i have come to arrange for your escape but at present flight is impossible and trench swayed upon his feet as he heard the word impossible asked feversham yes i brought three camels to omdurman of which two have died the effendi at suakin gave me money but not enough i could not arrange for the relays but if you will give me a letter to the effendi telling him to give me two hundred pounds then i will have everything ready and come again within three months trench turned his back so that his companion might not see his face all his spirit had gone from him at this last stroke of fortune the truth was clear to him appallingly clear kadar was not going to risk his life he would be the shuttle going backwards and forwards between omdurman and swakin as long as feversham cared to write letters and such to pay money but the shuttle would do no weaving i have nothing with which to write said feversham and abu kadar produced them be quick, he said, write quickly, lest we be discovered, and Feversham wrote, but though he wrote as Abel suggested, the futility of his writing was as clear to him as to Trench. There is the letter, he said, and he handed it to Abul, and taking Trench by the arm, walked without another word away. They passed out of the alley and came again to the great mud wall. It was sunset. To their left, the river gleamed with changing lights here it ran the color of an olive there rose pink and here again a brilliant green above their heads the stars were coming out in the east it was already dusk and behind them in the town drums were beginning to beat with their barbaric monotone both men walked with their chins sunk upon their breasts their eyes upon the ground they had come to the end of hope they were possessed with a lethargy of despair. Feverson 
thought not at all of the pine trees on the surrey hills nor did trench have any dread that something in his head would snap and that which made him man be reft from him they walked slowly as though their fetters had grown ten times their weight and without a word so stricken indeed were they that an arab turned and kept pace beside them and neither noticed his presence in a few moments the arab spoke the camels are ready in the desert ten miles to the west but he spoke in so low a voice that those to whom he spoke were so absorbed in misery that the words passed unheard he repeated them and feversham looked up quite slowly their meaning broke in on feversham's mind quite slowly he recognized the man who uttered them abu fatma he said whoosh returned abu fatma the camels are ready now now trench leaned against the wall with his eyes closed and the face of a sick man it seemed that he would swoon and feversham took him by the arm is it true trench asked faintly and before feversham could answer abu fatma went on walk forwards very slowly before you reach the end of the wall it will be dusk draw your cloaks over your heads wrap these rags around your chain so they do not rattle then turn and come back go close to the water beyond the storehouses i will be there with a man to remove your chains but keep your faces well covered and do not stop he will think you slaves with that he passed some rags to them holding his hands behind his back while they stood close to him then he turned and hurried back very slowly feversham and trench walked forwards in the direction of the prison the dusk crept across the river mounted the long slope of sand and enveloped them trench walked forwards in the direction of the prison the dusk crept across the river mounted the long slope of sand and enveloped them they sat down quickly wrapped the rags about their chains and secured them there from the west the colors of the sunset had altogether faded the darkness gathered quickly about them they turned and walked back along the road they had come the drums were more numerous now and above the wall there rose a glare of light by the time they had reached the water's edge opposite the storehouses it was dark abu fatma was already waiting with his blacksmith the chains were knocked off without a word spoken come said abu there will be no moon tonight how long before they discover you are gone who knows perhaps already idris has missed us perhaps he will not till morning there are many prisoners they ran up the slope of sand between the quarters of the tribes across the narrow width of the city through the cemetery on the far side of the cemetery stood a disused house a man rose up in the doorway as they approached and went in wait here said abu fatma and he too went into the house in a moment both men came back and each one led a camel and made it kneel mount said abu fatma bring its head round and hold it as you mount i know the trick said trench feversham climbed up behind him the two arabs mounted the second camel ten miles to the west said abu fatma and he struck the camel on the flanks behind them the glare of the lights dwindled the tapping of the drums diminished end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of the four feathers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. The Last of the Southern Cross. The wind blew keen and cold from the north. The camels, freshened by it, trotted out at their fastest pace. Quicker, said Trench between his teeth. Already Idris may have missed us. Even if he has, replied Feversham, it will take time to get men together for a pursuit, 
and those men must fetch their camels, and already it is dark. But although he spoke hopefully, he turned his head again and again towards the glare of light above Umdurin. He could no longer hear the tapping of the drums. That was some consolation. But he was in a country of silence, where men could journey swiftly and yet make no noise. There would be no sound of galloping horses to warn him that pursuit was at his heels. Even at that moment, the Ansar soldiers might be riding within thirty paces of them. And Feversham strained his eyes backwards into the darkness and expected the glimmer of a white turban. Trench, however, never turned his head. He rode with his teeth set, looking forward. Yet fear was no less strong in him than in Feversham. Indeed, it was stronger, for he did not look back towards Omdurman because he did not dare. And though his eyes were fixed directly in front of him, the things which he really saw were the long, narrow streets of the town behind him, the dotted fires at the corners of the streets, and the men running hither and thither among the houses, making their quick search for the two prisoners escaped from the House of Stone. Once his attention was diverted by a word from Feversham, and he answered without turning his head. What is it? I no longer see the fires of Omdurin. The golden blot, eh? Very low down? Trench answered in an abstracted voice. Feversham did not ask him to explain what his allusion meant, nor could Trench have disclosed why he had spoken it. The words had come back to him suddenly with a feeling that it was somehow appropriate that the vision which was the last thing to meet Feversham's eyes as he set out upon his mission, he should see again now that that mission was accomplished. They spoke no more until two figures rose out of the darkness in front of them, at the very feet of their camels, and Abu Fatma cried in a low voice, Instana! They halted their camels and made them kneel. The new camels are here, asked abu fatma and two of the men disappeared for a few minutes and brought four camels up meanwhile the saddles were unfashioned and removed from the camels trench and his companion had ridden out of omdurin they are good camels asked feversham as he helped to fix the saddles upon the fresh ones of the anafi breed answered abu fatma quick quick and he looked anxiously to the east and listened the arms said trench you have them where are they and he bent his body and searched the ground for them in a moment said abu fatma but it seemed that trench could hardly wait for that moment to arrive he showed even more anxiety to handle the weapons than he had shown fear that he would be overtaken there is ammunition he asked feverishly yes yes replied abu fatma ammunition and rifles and revolvers he led the way to a spot about twenty yards from the camels, where some long desert grass rustled about their legs. He stooped and dug into the soft sand with his hands. Here, he said. Trench flung himself upon the ground beside him and scooped with both hands, making all the while an inhuman whimpering sound with his mouth, like the noise a foxhound makes at a cover. There was something rather horrible to Feversham in his attitude, as he scraped at the ground on his knees, at the action of his hands, quick like movements of a dog's paw, and in the whine of his voice, he was sunk for the time into an animal. In a moment or two, Trench's fingers touched the lock and trigger of a rifle, and he became a man again. He stood up quietly with the rifle in his hands. The other arms were unearthed, the ammunition shared now said trench and he laughed with a great thrill of joy in his life now i don't mind let them follow from omdurman one thing is certain now i shall never go back there no not even if they overtake us and he fondled the rifle which he held and spoke to it as though it lived two of the arabs mounted the old camels and rode slowly away to omdurman abu fatma and the other remained with the fugitives they mounted and trotted northeastwards. No more than a quarter of an hour had elapsed since they had first halted at Abu Fatma's word. All that night they rode through the halfa grass and mimosa trees and went but slowly. But they came about sunrise onto a flat bare ground broken with small hillocks. 
are the effendi tired asked abu fatma will they stop and eat there is food upon the saddle of each camel no we can eat as we go dates and bread and a draught of water from zamshea made up their meal and they ate it as they sat their camels there indeed now that they were free of the long desert grass trotted at their quickest pace and at sunset that evening they stopped and rested for an hour all through the night they rode and the next day straining their own endurance and that of the beasts they were mounted on now ascending on to high and rocky ground now traversing a valley and now trotting fast across plains of honey-coloured sand yet to each man the pace seemed always as slow as a funeral a mountain would lift itself above the rim of the horizon at sunrise and for the whole livelong day it stood before their eyes and was never a foot higher or an inch nearer at times some men tilling a scanty patch of sorghum would send the fugitives heart leaping in their throats and they must make a wide detour or again a caravan would be sighted in the far distance by the keen eyes of abu fatma and they made their camels kneel and lay crouched behind a rock with their loaded rifles in their hands ten miles from abu Klia, a relay of fresh camels awaited them and upon these they travelled keeping a day's march westward of the nile through the desert country of the abab day and came in sight of a broad grey track stretching across their path the road from berber to merawi said abu fatma north of it we turn east to the river we cross the road tonight and if god wills tomorrow evening we have crossed the nile if god wills said trench if only he wills and he glanced about him in a fear which only increased the nearer they drew towards safety they were in a country traversed by the caravans it was no longer safe to travel by day they dismounted and all that day they led hidden behind a belt of shrubs upon some high ground and watched the road and the people like specks moving along it they came down and crossed it in the darkness and for the rest of that night travelled hard towards the river as the day broke abu fatma again bade them halt they were in a desolate open country whereon the smallest protection was magnified by the surrounding flatness feversham and trench gazed eagerly to their right somewhere in that direction and within the range of their eyesight flowed the nile but they could not see it we must build a circle of stone said abu fatma and you must lie close to the ground within it i will go forward to the river and see that the boat is ready that our friends are prepared for us i shall come back after dark they gathered the stones quickly and made a low wall about a foot high and within this wall feversham and trench laid themselves down upon the ground with a water skin and their rifles at their sides you have dates too said abu fatma yes then do not stir from the hiding place till i come back i will take your camels and bring you back fresh ones in the evening and in company with his fellow arab he rode off towards the river trench and feversham dug out the sand within the stones and lay down watching the horizon between the interstices for both of them this perhaps was the longest days of their lives they were so near to safety and set and yet not safe to trench's thinking it was longer than a night in a house of stone and to feversham's longer than even one of those days six years back when he had sat in his rooms above st john's park and waited for the night to fall before he dared venture out into the streets they were so near to berber and the pursuit must needs be close behind feversham lay wondering how he had ever found the courage to venture himself in berber they had no shade to protect him all day the sun burnt pitilessly upon their backs and within the narrow circle of stones they had no room wherein to move they spoke hardly at all the sunset however came at last the friendly darkness gathered about them and a cool wind rustled through the darkness across the desert listen said trench and both men as they strained their ears heard the soft padding of camels very near at hand 
a moment later a low whistle brought them out of their shelter we are here said feversham quietly god be thanked said abu fatma i have good news for you and bad news too the boat is ready our friends are waiting for us camels are prepared for you on the caravan track by the river bank to abu hamad but your escape is known and the roads and the ferries are closely watched before sunrise we must have struck inland from the eastern bank of the nile they crossed the river cautiously about one o'clock in the morning sank the boat upon the far side of the stream the camels were waiting for them and they travelled inland and more slowly than suited the anxiety of the fugitives for the ground was thickly covered with boulders and the camels could seldom proceed at any pace faster than a walk and all through the next day they lay hidden again within a ring of stones while the camels were removed to some high ground where they could graze during the next night however they made good progress and coming to the grove abu hamad in two days rested for twelve hours there and mounted upon a fresh relay from abu hamad their road lay across the great nubian desert nowadays the traveller may journey through the two hundred and forty miles of that waterless plain of cold black rock and yellow sand and sleep in his berth upon the way the morning will show to him perhaps a tent a great pile of coal a water tank and a number painted on a white signboard and the stoppage of the train will afford him that he has come to a station let him put his head from the window he will see the long line of telegraph poles reaching from the sky's rim behind him to the sky's rim in front and huddling together as it seems with less and less space between them the farther they are away twelve hours will enclose the beginning and end of his journey unless the engine breaks down or the rail be blocked but in the days when feversham and trench escaped from omdurman progression was not so easy a matter they kept eastward of the present railway and along the line of wells among the hills and on the second night of this stage of their journey trench shook feversham by the shoulders and waked him up look he said and he pointed to the south to-night there's no southern cross his voice broke with emotion for every night of six years until this night i have seen the southern cross how often have i lain awake watching it wondering whether the night would ever come when i should not see these four slanting stars i tell you feversham this is the first moment when i have really dared to think that we should escape both men sat up and watched the southern sky with prayers of thankfulness in their hearts and when they fell asleep as only to wake up again and again with a fear that they would after all still see that constellation blazing low down towards the earth and to fall asleep again confident of the issue of their desert ride at the end of seven days they came to shof el ain a tiny well set in a barren valley between featureless ridges and by the side of that well they camped they were in the country of the amrab arabs and had come to an end of their peril we are safe cried abu fatma god is good northwards to assurian westward to wadi hafa we are safe and spreading a cloth upon the ground in front of the kneeling camels he heaped dura before them he even went so far in his gratitude as to pat one of the animals upon the neck and it immediately turned upon him and snarled trench reached out his hand to feversham thank you he said simply no need of thanks answered feversham and he did not take the hand i served myself from first to last you have learned the churlessness of a camel cried trench a camel will carry you where you want to go will carry you till it drops dead and yet if you show your gratitude it resents and bites hang it all feversham there's my hand feversham untied a knot in the breast of his jibber and took out three white feathers two small the feathers of a heron and the other large one an ostrich feather broken from a fan will you take yours back yes 
You know what to do with it? Yes, there shall be no delay. Feversham wrapped the remaining feathers carefully away in a corner of his ragged jibber and tied them safe. We shake hands then, said he, and as their hands met, he added, tomorrow morning we part company. Part company? You and I? After the year in Omdurman, the weeks of flight, exclaimed Trench. Why? There's nothing no more to be done. Castleton's dead. You keep the feather which he sent, but he is dead. You can do nothing with it. You must come home. Yes, answered Feversham. But after you, certainly not with you. You go on to Assouan and Cairo. At each place you will find friends to welcome you. I shall not go with you. Trench was silent for a while. He understood Feversham's reluctance. He saw that it would be easier for Feversham if he were to tell his story first to Ethne Eustace and without Feversham's presence. I ought to tell you no one knows why you resigned your commission or of the feathers we sent. We never spoke of it. We agreed never to speak for the honor of the regiment. I can't tell you how glad I am that we all agreed and kept the agreement, he said. Perhaps you will see Durrance, said Feversham. If you do, give him a message from me. Tell him that the next time he asks me to come and see him, whether it is in England or Wadi Haifa, I will accept the invitation. Which way will you go? To Wadi Haifa, said Feversham, pointing westwards over his shoulder. I shall take Abu Fatma with me and travel slowly and quietly down the Nile. The other Arabs will guide you into Assuan. They slept that night in security beside the well, and the next morning they parted company. Trent was first to ride off as his camel rose to its feet, ready for the start. He bent down towards Feversham, who passed him the nose ring. Ramelton, that was the name I shall not forget. Yes, Ramelton, said Feversham. There's a ferry across Loft Swilly to Rathmullen. You must drive the twelve miles to Ramelton, but you may not find her there. If not there, I shall find her somewhere else. Make no mistake, Feversham. I shall find her. And Trench rode forward, alone with his Arab guide. More than once he turned his head and saw Feversham still standing by the well. More than once he was strongly drawn to stop and ride back to that solitary figure, but he contented himself with waving his hand, and even that salute was not returned. Feversham, indeed, had never thought nor eyes for the companion of his flight. His six years of hard probation had come this morning to an end, and yet he was more sensible of a certain loss and vacancy than of any joy. For six years, through many trials, through many falterings, his mission had strengthened and sustained him. It seemed to him now that there was nothing more wherewith to occupy his life. Ethne? No doubt she was long since married. And there came upon him all at once a great bitterness of despair for that futile, unnecessary mistake made by him six years ago. He saw again the room in London overlooking the quiet trees and lawns of St. James Park. He heard the knock upon the door. He took the telegram from his servant's hand. He roused himself finally with the recollection that, after all, the work was not quite done. There was his father, who just at this moment was very likely reading his times after breakfast upon the terrace of Broad Place, among the pine trees upon the Surrey Hills. He must visit his father. He must take the fourth feather back to Ramelton. There was a telegram, too, which must be sent to Lieutenant Such at Suakin. He mounted his camel and rode slowly with Abu Fatna, westwards towards Wadi Haifa. But the sense of loss did not pass from him that day, nor his anger at the act of folly which had brought about his downfall. The wooded slopes of Romelton were very visible to him across the shimmer of the desert air. In the greatness of his depression, Harry Feversham, upon this day, for the first time doubted his faith in the afterwards. End of chapter 30
Chapter Thirty One of the Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Feversham returns to Remelton. On an August morning of the same year, Harry Feversham rode across the Lennon Bridge into Remelton. The fierce suns of the Sudan had tanned his face. The years of his probation had left their marks. He rode up the narrow street of the town unrecognized. At the top of the hill, he turned into the broad highway which, descending valleys and climbing hills, runs in one straight line to Letter Kenny. He rode rather quickly in a company of ghosts. The intervening years had gradually been dropping from his thoughts all through his journey across Egypt and the continent. They were no more than visionary now, nor was he occupied with any dream of the things which might have been but for his great fault. The things which had been here in this small town of Ireland were too definite. Here he had been most happy, here he had known the uttermost of his misery. Here his presence had been pleasure. Here, too, he had done his worst harm. Once he stopped when he was opposite to the church, set high above the road upon his right hand, and wondered whether Ethne was still at Romelton, whether old Dermard was alive, and what kind of welcome he would receive. But he waked in a moment to the knowledge that he was sitting upon his horse, in the empty road and in the quiet of an August morning. There were larks singing in the pale blue above his head. A land rail set up its harsh cry from the meadow on the left. The crow of a cock rose clear from the valley. He looked about him and rode briskly on down the incline in front of him and up the ascent behind. He rode again with his company of ghosts phantoms of people with whom upon this road he had walked and ridden and laughed ghosts of old thoughts and recollected words he came to a thick grove of trees a broken fence a gateway with no gate inattentive to these evidences of desertion he turned in at the gate and rode along a weedy and neglected drive at the end of it he came to an open space before a ruined house the aspect of the tumbling walls and unroofed rooms roused him at last completely from his absorption. He dismounted, and tying his horse to the branch of a tree, ran quickly into the house and called aloud. No voice answered him. He ran from deserted room to deserted room. He descended upon the garden, but no one came to meet him, and he understood now from the uncut grass upon the lawn the tangled disorder of the flower beds that no one would come he mounted his horse again rode back at a sharp trot in romelton he stopped at the inn gave his horse to the ostler and ordered lunch for himself he said to the landlady who waited upon him so lennon house has been burned down when was that five years ago the landlady returned just five years ago this summer and she proceeded without further invitation to give a voluminous account of the conflagration and the cause of it the ruin of the estes family the inebriety of bastable and the death of dermot eustace at glenola but we hope to see the house rebuilt it's likely to be we hear when miss eustace is married she said in a voice which suggested that she was full of interesting information upon the subject of Miss Eustace's marriage. Her guest, however, did not respond to the invitation. And where does Miss Eustace live now? At Glenola, she replied. Halfway on the road to Rathmullen. There's a track leads up to your left. It's a poor mountain village in Glenola, and no place for Miss Eustace at all, at all. Perhaps you will be wanting to see her. Yes, I shall be glad if you will order my horse to be brought round to the door, said the man, and he rose from the table to put an end to the interview. The landlady, however, was not so easily dismissed. She stood at the door and remarked, 
Well, that's curious. That's most curious. For only a fortnight ago, a gentleman burnt just as black as yourself stayed a night here on the same errand. He asked for Miss Eustace's address and drove up to Glenola. Perhaps you have business with her. Yes, I have with Miss Eustace, the stranger returned. Will you be good enough to give orders about my horse? While he was waiting for his horse, he looked through the leaves of the hotel book and saw, under a date towards the end of July, the name of Colonel Trench. You will come back, sir, tonight, said the landlady as he mounted. No, he answered. I do not think I shall come again to Remalton. And he rode down the hill once more that day, crossed the London Bridge. Four miles on as he came to the track opposite a little bay of the low, and turning into it, he rode past a few white cottages up to the purple hollow of the hills. It was about five o'clock when he came to the long, straggling village. It seemed very quiet and deserted and built without any pain. A few cottages stood together, then came a gap of fields. Beyond that, a small plantation of larches and a house which stood by itself. Beyond the house was another gap, through which he could see straight down to the water of the loaf, shining in the afternoon sun, and the white gulls poising and swooping above it. And after passing that gap, he came to a small gray church, standing bare to the winds upon its tiny plateau, a pathway of white shell dust, led from the door of the church to the little wooden gate. As he came level with the gate, a collie dog barked at him from beyond it. The rider looked at the dog, which was very gray about the muzzle. He noticed its markings and stopped his horse altogether. He glanced towards the church and saw that the door stood open. At once he dismounted, he fastened his horse to the fence and entered the courtyard. A collie thrust its muzzle into the back of his knee, sniffed once or twice doubtfully, and suddenly broke into an exuberant welcome. The collie dog had a better memory than the landlady of the inn. He barked, wagged his tail, crouched and sprang at the stranger's shoulders, whirled round and round in front of him, burst into sharp, excited screams of pleasure, ran up to the church door, and barked furiously there, then ran back and jumped again upon his friend. The man caught the dog as it stood up with his forepaws upon his chest, patted it and laughed. Suddenly he ceased laughing and stood stock still with his eyes towards the open door of the church. In the doorway, Ethne Eustace was standing. He put the dog down and slowly walked up the path towards her. She waited on the threshold without moving, without speaking. She waited, watching him until he came close to her. Then she said simply, Harry? She was silent after that, nor did he speak. All the ghosts and phantoms of old thoughts in whose company he had traveled the whole of that day vanished away from his mind at her simple utterance of his name. Six years had passed since his feet crushed the gravel on the dawn of a June morning beneath her window and they looked at each other, remarking the changes which those six years had brought, and the changes, unnoticed and almost imperceptible to those who had lived daily in their company, sprang very distinct to the eyes of these two. Feversham was thin, his face was wasted, the strain of life in the house of stone had left its signs about its sunken eyes, and in the look of age beyond his years. But these were not the only changes as Ethne noticed. They were not, indeed, the most important ones. Her heart, although she stood so still and silent, went out to him in grief for the great troubles which he had endured, but she saw, too, that he came back without a thought of anger towards her, for that fourth feather snapped from her fan. But she was clear-eyed, even at this moment. She saw much more. She understood that the man who stood quietly before her now was not the same man whom she had last seen at the Hall of Romelton. There had been a timidity in his manner in those days, a particular diffidence, a continual expectation of other men's contempt, which had gone from him. He was now quietly self-possessed, not arrogant, on the other hand, not diffident. 
he had put himself to a long hard test and he knew that he had not failed all that she saw and her face lightened as she said it is not all harm which has come of these years they were not wasted but feversham thought of her lonely years in this village of glenall and thought with a man's thought unaware that nowhere else would she have chosen to live he looked into her face saw the marks of the years upon it it was not that she had aged so much her big gray eyes shone as cleanly as before the color was still as bright upon her cheeks but there was more of character she had suffered she had eaten at the tree of knowledge i am sorry he said i did you a great wrong six years ago and i need not she held out her hand to him will you give it to me please and for a moment he did not understand that fourth feather she said he drew his letter case from his coat and shook two feathers out into the palm of his hand the larger one the ostrich feather he held out to her but she said both there was no reason why he should keep castleton's feather any longer he handed them both to her since she asked for them and she clasped them and with a smile treasured them against her breast i have the four feathers now she said yes answered feversham all four what will you do with them ethne's smile became a laugh do with them she cried in scorn i shall do nothing with them i shall keep them i am very proud to have them to keep she kept them as she had once kept harry feversham's portrait there was something perhaps in durrance's contention that women so much more than men gather up their experiences and live upon them looking backwards feversham at all events would now have dropped the feathers then and there and crushed them into the dust of the path with his heel they had done their work they could no longer reproach they were no longer needed to encourage they were dead things ethne however held them tight in her hand to her they were not dead colonel trench was here a fortnight ago she said he told me you were bringing it back to me but he did not know of the fourth feather said feversham i never told any man that i had it yes you told colonel trench on your first night in the house of stone at omdurman he told me i no longer hate him she added but without a smile and quite seriously as though it was an important statement which needed careful recognition i am glad of that said feversham he is a great friend of mine ethne was silent for a moment or two then she said i wonder whether you have forgotten our drive from ramelton to our house when i came to fetch you from the quay we were alone in a dog cart and we spoke of the friends whom one knows for friends the first moment and whom one seems to recognize even though one has never seen them before interrupted feversham indeed i remember and whom one never loses whether absent or dead continued ethne i say that one can always be sure of such friends and you answered i answered that one can make mistakes again feversham interrupted yes and i disagreed i said that one might seem to make mistakes and perhaps think so for a long while but that in the end one would be proved not to have made them i have often thought of those words i remembered them very clearly when captain willoughby brought to me the first feather and with a great deal of remorse i remember them again very clearly to-day although i have no room in my thoughts for remorse i was right you see and i should have clung firmly to my faith but i did not her voice shook a little and pleaded as she went on i was young i knew very little i was unaware how little i judged hastily but today i understand she opened her hand and gazed for a while at the white feathers then she turned and went inside the church feversham followed her end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of the four feathers this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wolfe. The Four Feathers by A.E.W. Mason. Chapter 32. 
in the church at Glenalla. Ethne sat down in the corner of a pew next to the aisle, and Feversham took his stand beside her. It was very quiet and peaceful within that tiny church. The afternoon sun shone through the upper windows and made a golden haze about the roof. The natural murmurs of the summer floated pleasantly through the open door. I am glad that you remembered our drive and what we said, she continued. It is rather important to me that you should remember, because although I have you back, I am going to send you away from me again. You will be one of the absent friends whom I shall not lose because you are absent. She spoke slowly, looking straight in front of her without faltering. It was a difficult speech for her to deliver, but she had thought it over night and day during the last fortnight, and the words were ready to her lips. At the first sight of Harry Feversham, recovered to her after so many years, so much suspense, so much suffering, it had seemed to her that she never would be able to speak them, however necessary it was that they should be spoken. But as they stood over against one another, she had forced herself to remember that necessity until she actually recognized and felt it. Then she had gone back into the church and taken a seat and gathered up her strength. It would be easier for both of them, she thought, if she should give no sign of what so quick a separation cost her. He would know surely enough, and she wished him to know. She wished him to understand that not one moment of his six years, so far as she was concerned, had been spent in vain. But that could be understood without the signs of emotion. So she spoke her speech, looking steadily straightforward and speaking in an even voice. I know that you will mind very much, just as I do. But there is no help for it, she resumed. At all events, you are at home again, with the right to be at home. It is a great comfort to me to know that. But there are other, much greater reasons from which we can both take comfort. Colonel Trench told me enough of your captivity to convince me that we both see with the same eyes. We both understand that this second parting, hard as it is, is still a very slight, small thing compared with the other, our first parting over at the house six years ago. I felt very lonely after that, as I shall not feel lonely now. There was a great barrier between us then, separating us forever. We should never have met again, here or afterwards. I am quite sure of that. But you have broken that barrier down by all your pain and bravery during these last years. I am no less sure of that. I am absolutely confident about it, and I believe you are too. So that although we shall not see one another here and as long as we live, the afterwards is quite sure for us both, and we can wait for that. You can. You have waited with so much strength all these years since we parted, and I can too, for I get strength from your victory. She stopped, and for a while there was silence in that church. To Feversham her words were gracious as rain upon dry land. To hear her speak them uplifted him so that those six years of trial, of slinking into corners out of the sight of his fellows, of lonely endurance, of many heart sinkings and much bodily pain dwindled away into insignificance they had indeed borne their fruit to him for ethne had spoken in a gentle voice just what his ears had so often longed to hear as he lay awake at night in the bazaar at sukan in the nile villages in the dim wide spaces of the desert and what he had hardly dared to hope she would ever speak he stood quite silently by her side still hearing her voice though the voice had ceased Long ago there were certain bitter words which she had spoken, and he had told such. So closely had they clung and stung, that he believed in his dying moments he would hear them again, and so go to his grave with their reproaches ringing in his ears. He remembered that prediction of his now, and knew that it was false. The words he would hear would be those which she had just uttered. For Ethne's proposal that they should separate he was not unprepared. He had heard already that she was engaged and he did not argue against her wish. But he understood that she had more to say to him, and she had, but she was slow to speak it. This was the last time she was to see Harry Feversham. She meant resolvedly to send him away, when once he had passed through the church door through which the sunlight and the summer murmurs came, and his shadow gone from the threshold, she would never talk with him or set her eyes on him until her life was ended. So she deferred the moment of his going by silences and slow speech. It might be so very long before that end came. She had, she thought, the right to protract this one interview. She rather hoped that he would speak of his travels, his dangers. She was prepared to discuss at length with him even the politics of the Sudan. But he waited for her. I am going to be married, she said at length, and immediately. I am to marry a friend of yours, Colonel Durrance. 
There was hardly a pause before Feversham answered. He has cared for you a long while. I was not aware of it until I went away, but thinking over everything, I thought it likely, and in a very little time I became sure. He is blind. Blind, exclaimed Feversham. He of all men, blind? Exactly. He of all men. His blindness explains everything. Why I marry him, why I send you away. It was after he went blind that I became engaged to him. It was before Captain Willoughby came to me with the first feather. It was between those two events. You see, after you went away, one thought over things rather carefully. I used to lie awake and think, and I resolved that two men's lives should not be spoilt because of me. Mine was not, Feversham interrupted. Please believe that. Partly it was, she returned. I know very well. You would not own it for my sake, but it was. I was determined that a second should not be. And so when Colonel Durrance went blind, you know the man he was, you can understand what blindness meant to him, the loss of everything he cared for, except you. Yes, Ethne answered quietly, except me. So I became engaged to him. But he has grown very quick, you cannot guess how quick, and he sees so very clearly. A hint tells him the whole hidden truth. At present he knows nothing of the four feathers. Are you sure? suddenly exclaimed Feversham. Yes. Why? asked Ethne turning her face towards him for the first time since she had sat down. Lieutenant Such was at Selkin while I was at Omdurman. He knew that I was a prisoner there. He sent messages to me. He tried to organize my escape. Ethne was startled. Oh, she said. Colonel Durant certainly knew that you were in Omdurman. He saw you in Wadi Halfa, and he heard that you had gone south into the desert. He was distressed about it. He asked a friend to get news of you, and the friend got news that you were in Omdurman. He told me so himself. And yes, he told me that he would try to arrange for your escape. He has been at Weisbaden with an occultist. He only returned a week ago. Otherwise, he would have told me about it. Very likely, he was the reason why Lieutenant Such was at Sokin. But he knows nothing of the Four Feathers. He only knows that our engagement was abruptly broken off. He believes that I no longer have any thought of you at all. But if you come back, if you and I saw anything of each other, however calmly we met, however indifferently we spoke, he would guess. He is so quick he would be sure to guess. She paused for a moment and added in a whisper, and he would guess right. Feversham saw the blood flush her forehead and deepen the color of her cheeks. He did not move from his position. He did not bend towards her, or even in a voice give any sign that would make this leave-taking yet more difficult to carry through. Yes, I see, he said, and he must not guess. No, he must not, returned Ethne. I am so glad you see that too, Harry. The straight and simple thing is the only thing for us to do. He must never guess, for, as you said, he has nothing left but me. Is Durance here? asked Feversham. He is staying at the vicarage. Very well, he said. It is only fair that I should tell you that I had no thought that you would wait. I had no wish that you should. I had no right to such a wish. When you gave me that fourth feather in the little room at Remelton, with the music coming faintly through the door, I understood your meaning. There was to be a complete, an irrevocable end. We were not to be the merest acquaintances. So I said nothing to you of the plan which came clear and definite into my mind at the very time when you gave me the feathers. You see, I might never have succeeded. I might have died trying to succeed. I might even perhaps have shirked the attempt. It would be time enough for me to speak if I came back. So I never formed any wish that you should wait. That is what Colonel Trench told me. I told him that, too, on your first night in the House of Stone. Well, it's just the truth, the most I hoped for, and I did hope for that every hour of every day, was that if I did come home, you would take back your feather, and that we might not renew our friendship here, but see something of one another afterwards. Yes, said Ethne, then there will be no parting. Ethne spoke very simply, without even a sigh, but she looked at Harry Feversham as she spoke and smiled. The look and the smile told him what the cost of the separation would be to her, and, understanding what it meant now, he understood with an infinitely greater completeness than he ever reached in his lonely communings what it must have meant six years ago when she was left with her pride stricken as solely as her heart. "'What trouble you must have gone through!' he cried, and she turned and looked him over. "'Not I alone,' she said gently. "'I passed no nights in the House of Stone.' But it was my fault. Do you remember what you said when the morning came through the blinds? It's not right that one should suffer so much pain. It was not right. 
I had forgotten the words, oh, a long time since, until Colonel Trench reminded me. I should never have spoken them. When I did, I was not thinking they would live so in your thoughts. I am sorry that I spoke them. Oh, they were just enough. I never blamed you for them, said Feversham with a laugh. I used to think that they would be the last words I should ever hear when I turned my face to the wall. But you have given me others today wherewith to replace them. Thank you, she said quietly. There was nothing more to be said, and Feversham wondered why Ethne did not rise from her seat in the pew. It did not occur to him to talk of his travels or adventures. The occasion seemed too serious, too vital. They were together to decide the most solemn issues in their lives. Once the decision was made, as now it had been made, he felt that they could hardly talk on other topics. Ethne, however, still kept him at her side. Though she sat so calmly and still, though her face was quiet in its look of gravity, her heart ached with longing. Just for a little longer, she pleaded to herself. The sunlight was withdrawing from the walls of the church. She measured out a space upon the walls where it still glowed bright. When all that space was cold gray stone, she would send Harry Feversham away. I am glad that you escaped from Omdurman without the help of Lieutenant Such or Colonel Durrance. I wanted so much that everything should be done by you alone without anybody's help or interference. She said, and after she had spoken, there followed a silence. Once or twice she looked towards the wall, and each time she saw the space of golden light narrowed and knew that her minutes were running out. You suffered horribly at Dongola, she said in a low voice. Colonel Trench told me. What does it matter now? Feversham answered. That time seems rather far away to me. Had you anything of mine with you? I had your white feather. But anything else? Any little thing which I had given you in the other days? Nothing. I had your photograph, she said. I kept it. Feversham suddenly leaned down towards her. You did? Ethne nodded her head. Yes, the moment I went upstairs that night, I packed up your presents and addressed them to your rooms. Yes, I got them in London. But I put your photograph aside, first of all, to keep. I burnt all your letters after I had addressed the parcel and taken it down the hall to be sent away. I had just finished burning your letters when I heard your steps upon the gravel in the early morning beneath my windows. But I had already put your photograph aside. I have it now. I shall keep it and the feathers together, she added after a moment. I rather wish you had something of mine with you all the time. I had no right to anything, said Feversham. There was still a narrow slip of gold upon the gray space of stone. What will you do now? she asked. I shall go home first and see my father. It will depend upon the way we meet. You will let Colonel Durrance know. I would like to hear about it. Yes, I will write to Durrance. The slip of gold was gone. The clear light of a summer evening filled the church, a light without radiance or any color. I shall not see you for a long while, said Ethne, and for the first time her voice broke into a sob. I shall not have a letter from you again. She leaned a little forward and bent her head, for the tears had gathered in her eyes. But she rose up bravely from her seat, and together they went out of the church side by side. She leaned towards him as they walked, so that they touched. Feversham untied his horse and mounted it. As his foot touched the stirrup, Ethne caught her dog close to her. Goodbye, she said. She did not now even try to smile. She held out her hand to him. He took it and bent down from his saddle close to her. She kept her eyes steadily upon him through the tears brimmed in them. Goodbye, he said. He held her hand for just a little while, and then releasing it, rode down the hill. He rode for a hundred yards, stopped, and looked back. Ethne had stopped too, and with this space between them and their faces towards one another they remained. Ethne made no sign of recognition or farewell. She just stood and looked. Then she turned away and went up the village street towards her house alone and very slowly. Feversham watched her till she went in at the gate, but she became dim and blurred to his vision before even she had reached it. He was able to see, however, that she did not look back again. He rode down the hill. The bad thing which he had done so long ago was not even by his six years of labor to be destroyed. It was still to live. Its consequence was to be sorrow until the end of life for another than himself. That she took the sorrow bravely and without complaint, doing the straight and simple thing as her loyal nature bade her, did not diminish Harry Feversham's remorse. On the contrary, it taught him yet more clearly that she least of all deserved unhappiness. The harm was irreparable. Other women might have forgotten, but not she, for Ethne was of those who neither lightly feel nor lightly forget, and if they love, cannot love with half a heart. She would be alone now, he knew, in spite of her marriage, 
alone up to the very end and at the actual moment of death. End of chapter 32「Chapter 33 of the Four Feathers – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wolfe – The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason Chapter 33 – Ethne Again Plays the Mussolini Overture The incredible words were spoken that evening. Ethne went into her farmhouse and sat down in the parlor. She felt cold that summer evening and had the fire lighted. She sat gazing into the bright coals with that stillness of attitude which was a sure sign with her of tense emotion. The moment so eagerly looked for had come, and it was over. She was alone now in a remote little village, out of the world in the hills, and more alone than she had been since Willoughby sailed on that August morning down the Salcombe estuary. From the time of Willoughby's coming, she had looked forward night and day to the one half-hour during which Harry Faversham would be with her. The half-hour had come and passed. She knew now how she had counted upon its coming, how she had lived for it. She felt lonely in a rather empty world. But it was part of her nature that she had foreseen this sense of loneliness. She had known that there would be a bad hour for her after she had sent Harry Faversham away that all her heart and soul would clamor to her to call him back, and she forced herself, as she sat shivering by the fire, to remember that she had always foreseen and had always looked beyond it. Tomorrow she would know again that they had not parted forever. Tomorrow she would compare the parting of today with the parting on that night of the ball at Lennon House, and recognize what a small thing this was to that. She fell to wondering what Harry Feversham would do now that he had returned and while she was building up for him a future of great distinction, she felt Dermod's old collie-dog nuzzling at her hand with his sure instinct that his mistress was in distress. Ethne rose from her chair and took the dog's head between her hands and kissed it. He was very old, she thought. He would die soon and leave her, and then there would be years and years, perhaps, before she lay down in her bed and knew the great moment was at hand. There came a knock upon the door, and a servant told her that Colonel Durrance was waiting. Yes, she said, and as he entered the room, she went forward to meet him. She did not shirk the part which she had allotted to herself. She stepped out from the secret chamber of her grief as soon as she was summoned. She talked with her visitor as though no unusual thing had happened an hour before. She even talked of their marriage and the rebuilding of Linen House. It was difficult, but she had grown used to difficulties. Only that night, Durrance made her path a little harder to tread. He asked her, after the maid had brought in the tea, to play to him the Mousseline Overture upon her violin. Not tonight, said Ethne. I am rather tired. And she had hardly spoken before she changed her mind. Ethne was determined that in the small things as well as the great she must not shirk. The small things with their daily happenings were just those about which she must be most careful. Still, I think that I can play the Overture, she said with a smile, and she took down her violin. She played the overture through from the beginning to the end. Durrance stood at the window with his back towards her until she had ended. Then he walked to her side. I was rather a brute, he said quietly, to ask you to play that overture tonight. I wasn't anxious to play, she answered as she laid the violin aside. I know, but I was anxious to find out something, and I knew no other way of finding it out. Ethne turned up to him a startled face. What do you mean? she asked in a voice of suspense. You are so seldom off your guard, only indeed at rare times when you play. Once before, when you played that overture, you were off your guard. I thought that if I could get you to play it again tonight, the overture which was once strummed out in a dingy cafe at Wadi Halfa, tonight again I should find you off your guard. His words took her breath away and the colors from her cheeks. She got up slowly from her chair and stared at him wide-eyed. He could not know. It was impossible. He did not know. But Durrance went quietly on. Well, did you take back your feather, the fourth one? These to Ethne were the incredible words. Durrance spoke them with a smile upon his face. It took her a long time to understand that he had actually spoken them. She was not sure at the first that her overstrained senses were not playing her tricks, but he repeated his question, and she could no longer disbelieve or misunderstand. 
"'Who told you of any fourth feather?' she asked. "'Trench,' he answered. "'I met him at Dover, but he only told me of the fourth feather,' said Durrance. "'I knew of the three before. "'Trench would never have told me of the fourth had I not known of the three, "'for I should not have met him as he landed from the steamer at Dover. "'I should not have asked him where is Harry Feversham, "'and for me to know of the three was enough.' "'How do you know?' she cried in a kind of despair, and coming close to her he took gently a hold of her arm. "'But since I know,' he protested, "'what does it matter how I know? I have known a long while, ever since Captain Willoughby came to the pool with the first feather. I waited to tell you that I knew until Harry Feversham came back, and he came today.' Ethne sat down in her chair again. She was stunned by Durrance's unexpected disclosure. She had so carefully guarded her secret that to realize that for a year it had been no secret came as a shock to her. But even in the midst of her confusion, she understood that she must have time to gather up her faculties again under command. So she spoke of the unimportant thing to gain the time. You were in the church then, or you heard us upon the steps, or you met him as he rode away. Not one of the conjectures is right, said Durrance, with a smile. Ethne had hit upon the right subject to delay the statement of the decision to which she knew very well that he had come. Durrance had his vanities like others, and in particular one vanity which had sprung up within him since he had become blind. He prided himself upon the quickness of his perception. It was a delight to him to make discoveries which no one expected a man who had lost his sight to make, and to announce them unexpectedly. It was an additional pleasure to relate to his puzzled audience the steps by which he had reached its discovery. "'Not one of your conjectures is right, Ethne,' he said, and he practically asked her to question him. "'Then how did you find out?' she asked. "'I knew from Trench that Harry Feversham would come some day, and soon. I passed the church this afternoon. Your collie dog barked at me, so I knew you were inside. But a saddled horse was tied up beside the gate, so someone else was with you, and not any one from the village. Then I got you to play.' and that told me who it was who rode the horse. Yes, said Ethne, vaguely. She had barely listened to his words. Yes, I see. Then in a definite voice, which showed that she had regained all her self-control, she said, You went away to Wiesbaden for a year. You went away just after Captain Willoughby came. Was that the reason why you went away? I went because neither you nor I could have kept up the game of pretenses we were playing. You were pretending that you had no thought for Harry Feversham, that you hardly cared whether he was alive or dead. I was pretending not to have found out that beyond everything in the world you cared for him. Some day or other we should have failed, each one in turn. I dared not fail, nor dared you. I could not let you, who had said, two lives must not be spoilt because of me, live through a year thinking that two lives had been spoilt. You on your side dared not let me who had said marriage between a blind man and a woman is only possible when there is more than friendship on both sides, know that upon one side there was only friendship, and we were so near to failing, so I went away. You did not fail, said Ethne, quietly. It was only I who failed. She blamed herself most bitterly. She had set herself as the one thing worth doing and incumbent upon her to do, to guard this man from knowledge which would set the crown on its calamities and she had failed. He had set himself to protect her from the comprehension that she had failed, and he had succeeded. It was not any mere sense of humiliation due to the fact that the man whom she had thought to hoodwink had hoodwinked her, which troubled her, but she felt that she ought to have succeeded, since by failure she had robbed him of his last chance of happiness. There lay the sting for her. But it was not your fault, he said. Once or twice, as I said, you were off your guard, but the convincing facts were not revealed to me in that way. When you played the Mussolini overture before, on the night of the day when Willoughby brought you such good news, I took to myself that happiness of yours which inspired your playing. You must not blame yourself. On the contrary, you should be glad that I have found out. Glad? she exclaimed. Yes, for my sake, glad. And as she looked at him in wonderment, he went on. Two lives should not be spoilt because of you. Had you had your way, had I not found out, not two, but three lives would have been spoilt because of you, because of your loyalty. Three? Yours. 
Yes, yes, yours, Feversham's, and mine. It was hard enough to keep the pretense during the few weeks we were in Devonshire. Own to it, Ethne. When I went to London to see my oculist, it was a relief. It gave you a pause, a rest wherein to drop pretense and be yourself. It could not have lasted long even in Devonshire. But what when we came to live under the same roof, and there were no visits to the oculist, when we saw each other every hour of every day? Sooner or later the truth must have come to me. It might have come gradually, a suspicion added to a suspicion and another to that until no doubt was left. Or it might have flashed out in one terrible moment, but it would have been made clear. And then, Ethne, what then? You aimed at a compensation. You wanted to make up for me the loss of what I love, my career, the army, the special service in the strange quarters of the world. A fine compensation to sit in front of you knowing you had married a cripple out of pity, and that in so doing you had crippled yourself and foregone the happiness which is yours by right. Whereas now, whereas now, she repeated, I remain your friend, which I would rather be than your unloved husband, he said very gently. Ethne made no rejoinder. The decision had been taken out of her hands. You sent Harry away this afternoon, said Durrance. You said good-bye to him twice. At the twice, Ethne raised her head, but before she could speak, Durrance explained. Once in the church, again upon your violin, and he took up the instrument from the chair on which she had laid it. It has been a very good friend, your violin, he said, a good friend to me, to us all. You will understand that, Ethne, very soon. I stood at the window while you played it. I had never heard anything in my life half as sad as your farewell to Harry Feversham and yet it was nobly sad. It was true music. It did not complain. He laid the violin down upon the chair again. I am going to send a messenger to Rathmullen. Harry cannot cross Low Swelly tonight. The messenger will bring him back tomorrow. It had been a day of many emotions and surprises for Ethne. As Durrance bent down towards her, he became aware that she was crying silently. For once tears had their way with her. He took his cap and walked noiselessly to the door of the room. As he opened it, Ethne got up. Don't go for a moment, she said, and she left the fireplace and came to the center of the room. The oculus of Wiesbaden, she asked. He gave you a hope? Durrance stood meditating whether he should lie or speak the truth. No, he said at length. There is no hope. But I am not so helpless as at one time I was afraid I should be. I can get about, can't I? Perhaps one of these days I shall go on a journey one of the long journeys amongst the strange people in the East. He went from the house upon his errand. He had learned his lesson a long time since, and the violin had taught it to him. It had spoken again that afternoon, and though with a different voice, had offered to him the same message. The true music cannot complain. End of chapter 33《ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ The elder of the two turned over a sheet. I see Osmond Dinga's back at Suakin, said he. There's likely to be some fighting. Oh, said the other, he will not do much harm, and he laid down his paper. The quiet English countryside vanished from before his eyes. He saw only the white city by the Red Sea shimmering in the heat, the brown plains about it with their tangle of halfa grass, and in the distance, The hills toward Kor Gwab. A stuffy place, Suakin, eh, such? said General Feversham. Appallingly stuffy. I heard of an officer who went down on parade at six o'clock in the morning there, sunstruck in the temples right through the regulation helmet. Yes, a town of dank heat. But I was glad to be there, very glad, he said with some feeling. Yes, said Feversham, briskly. Ibex, eh? No, replied Such. All the ibex had been shot off by the English garrison for miles around. No? Something to do, then. That's it? Yes. That's it, Feversham, 
something to do. And both men busied themselves again over their papers. But in a little while a footman brought to each a small pile of letters. General Feversham ran over his envelopes with a quick eye, selected one letter, and gave a grunt of satisfaction. He took a pair of spectacles from a case and placed them upon his nose. "'From Ramelton,' asked Such, dropping his newspaper on the terrace. "'From Ramelton,' answered Feversham. "'I'll light a cigar first. He laid the letter down on the garden table, which stood between his companion and himself, drew a cigar case from his pocket, and in spite of the impatience of Lieutenant Such, proceeded to cut and light it with the utmost deliberation. The old man had become an epicure in this respect. A letter from Ramelton was a luxury to be enjoyed with all the accessories of comfort which could be obtained. He made himself comfortable in his chair, stretched out his legs, and smoked enough of his cigar to assure himself that it was drawing well. Then he took up his letter again and opened it. "'From him?' asked Such. "'No, from her.' "'Ah!' General Feversham read the letter through slowly, while Lieutenant Such tried not to peep at it across the table. When the general had finished, he turned back to the first page and began it again. "'Any news?' said Such, with a casual air. They are very pleased with the house, now that it's rebuilt. Anything more? Yes, Harry's finished the sixth chapter of his history of the war. Good, said Such. You'll see. He'll do that well. He has imagination. He knows the ground. He was present while the war went on. Moreover, he was in the bazaars. He saw the underside of it. Yes, but you and I won't read it, Such, said Feversham. No, I am wrong. You may, for you can give me a good many years. He turned back to his letter, and again Such asked. Anything more? Yes. They are coming here, in a fortnight. Good, said Such. I'll stay. He took a turn along the terrace and came back. He saw Feversham sitting with the letter upon his knees, and a frown of great perplexity upon his face. You know, Such, I never understood, he said. Did you? Yes, I think I did. Such did not try to explain. It was well, he thought, that Feversham never would understand, for he could not understand without much self-reproach. Do you ever see Durance? asked the general suddenly. Yes, I see a good deal of Durance. He is abroad just now. Feversham turned towards his friend. He came to Broad Place when you went to Suakin, and talked to me for half an hour. He was Harry's best man. Well, that, too, I never understood. Did you? Yes, I understood that as well. Oh, said General Feversham. He asked for no explanations, but, as he had always done, he took the questions which he did not understand, and put them aside out of his thoughts. But he did not turn to his other letters. He sat smoking his cigar, and looking out across the summer country, and listening to the sounds rising distinctly from the fields. Such had read through all his correspondence before Feversham spoke again. "'I have been thinking,' he said. "'Have you noticed the date of the month, Such?' And Such looked up quickly. "'Yes,' said he. "'This day next week will be the anniversary of our attack upon the Redan, and Harry's birthday.' "'Exactly,' replied Feversham. Why shouldn't we start the Crimean Nights again? Such jumped up from his chair. Splendid, he cried. Can we muster a tableful, do you think? Let's see, said Feversham, and ringing a handbell upon the table, he sent the servant for the army list. Bending over the army list, the two veterans may be left. But of one other figure in this story a final word must be said. That night, when the invitations had been sent out from Broad Place, and no longer a light gleamed from any window of the house, a man leaned over the rail of a steamer anchored at Port Sayed and listened to the song of the Arab coolies as they trampled up and down the planks with their coal baskets between the barges and the ship's side. The clamor of the streets of the town came across the water to his ears. He pictured to himself the fire of braziers upon the quays, the lighted portholes, and dark funnels ahead and behind in the procession of the anchored ships. 
Attended by a servant, he had come back to the east again. Early the next morning, the steamer moved through the canal, and towards the time of sunset passed out into the chills of the Gulf of Suez. Kassasin, Tel Ekbir, Tel El Kabir, Tamai, Tamaniab, the attack upon McNeil's Zariba. Durance lived again through the good years of his activity, the years of plenty. Within that country on the west, the long preparations were going steadily forward, which would one day roll up the dervish empire and crush it into dust. Upon the glacis of the ruined fort of Sinkat, Durance had promised himself to take a hand in that great work, but the desert which he loved had smitten and cast him out. But at all events, the boat steamed southwards into the Red Sea. Three nights more, and though he would not see it, the Southern Cross would lift slantwise into the sky. End of chapter 34 End of the Four Feathers by Alfred Edward Woodley Mason